Chapter One of Who Did It by Nat Gould. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Mystery The Ministry was defeated on a question of vital importance. The Premier placed the resignation of himself and colleagues in the hands of His Excellency the governor of new south wales a dissolution was granted and an appeal to the electors was shortly to take place sydney as the capital of this important colony was in a turmoil of excitement the labour members were determined to show a bold front in the city and suburban constituencies and capable men had been selected to fight for the cause capital opposed labour in order to safeguard its rights not out of any desire to deal unjustly with the men on the opposite side the strife promised to be severe and nowhere more so than in balmain east the constituency which for several years had returned as one of its members mr henry bryce the principal partner in the firm of bryce golding and company stock and station agents henry bryce was a wealthy man an example of what can be done by energy and industry aided by a fair amount of brains and well balanced by common sense he was a man nearly sixty years of age but luke ten years younger he was often heard to declare he never felt more fit for work in his life than at the present time although a hard-working man he had been a lucky man and even his station properties had turned out well the Labour Party decided to fight against Henry Bryce on this occasion. A dead set was to be made against him, on account of a shearer's strike which had taken place on one of his stations. On this occasion Henry Bryce had proved victorious, and managed to shear all his sheep with non-union labour. In the eyes of the leaders of the Labour Party, this was an unpardonable sin it mattered not to the labour leaders whether henry bryce fancied he was acting rightly in the matter he had no option according to their decree union labour the leaders declared must be employed and henry bryce and other squatters must obey their dictum it was of no use trying to browbeat henry bryce in this manner he had worked hard for his possessions and he meant to have a free hand in dealing with them he offered the unionists the wages asked but he declined to be bound down to employ none but union men it was on this rock henry bryce and the labour leaders had split neither side would give way and when henry bryce proved he was independent of the unionists the pill was too bitter for them to easily swallow the election gave them a chance of retaliating by opposing mr bryce for balmain east there were other members more opposed to the Labour Party than Henry Bryce, but it was the success of the latter against him in a pitched battle that had made them marshal their forces against him. This opposition only stimulated Henry Bryce to strain every nerve to retain his seat. He had been offered more than one seat in which he could walk over, but he declined and decided it should be Balmain East he would contest and abide by the decision of the electors. The fight raged bitterly, but no insults or scurrilous attacks were made on Henry Bryce. The Labour Party acknowledged he was an upright man, and had led an almost blameless life. They opposed him solely on the ground that he was not in favour of unionism. Henry Bryce resided in a fine house at Potts Point, and accordingly he generally went over the ferry to Balmain to attend meetings, and interview his constituents he had an important meeting one dark dreary night and his daughter ida bryce tried hard to persuade him not to attend mrs bryce took very little interest in politics or in fact in anything but herself it was the one great mistake henry bryce had made when he married a second time and placed a stepmother over his son and daughter i must go ida said henry bryce it is most important i dare not miss a single meeting it will be taken as a sign of weakness 
do not worry your father ida said mrs bryce you know he is wedded to politics if he failed to attend this meeting politics would bring an action for divorce against him now if i had requested him to take me to the theatre on this particular night it would have been different i am sure your persuasive powers to induce your father to remain at home would not have been expended in vain ida bryce made no reply she had long given up entering into wordy arguments with her stepmother and that lady was exasperated accordingly nothing pleasing her better than a battle of words with ida there is nothing to hinder you going to the theatre to-night if you wish said henry bryce to his wife ida will accompany you certainly if you wish it replied ida perhaps ida would prefer your political meeting said mrs bryce with a sarcastic smile nonsense said henry bryce send for tickets at once it is rather late but they will reserve you seats i am sure will you go ida asked mrs bryce if you wish it she replied i do wish it said mrs bryce harshly the girl's quiet almost contemptuous manner nettled her ida bryce knew more about her stepmother's doings than henry bryce in such matters he was often dangerously blind and trusting then it's settled said henry bryce you are for pleasure i am for business i may be rather late home there is a committee meeting after the speeches is mr golding to be there asked mrs bryce i believe so he said he would come round herbert golding was a partner in the firm of bryce golding and company ida bryce did not like herbert golding but he was a favourite with mrs bryce perhaps this accounted for the girl's antipathy to him henry bryce crossed over to balmain and attended his meeting it was reported afterwards he had never met with such a cordial reception and the committee were certain he would be returned at the head of the poll he left the meeting in excellent spirits and declining the offer of one of his chief supporters to see him safely home walked away in the direction of the ferry it was close upon midnight and a small knot of people stood on the AUSN company's wharf awaiting the arrival of the wodonga from brisbane she's late in said one of the men employed on the wharf i ain't heard a whistle yet she's entered the harbour said another man who told you silent billy was the reply it was so unusual for silent billy as the man was called to make a remark that it was evident those present doubted the information if you don't believe me ask him yourself said the man who had referred to silent billy sauntering along the wharf was a short thick-set man in a pilot jacket and slouch hat his breeches were of a dull blue and he had on heavy boots he had a stern face and his shaggy whiskers were grey and stuck out like wires this was silent billy a man seldom known to speak unless he was spoken to and then only to say the briefest possible reply say billy is the wodonga in the harbour the man made no reply but proceeded to clamber down the side of the wharf and get into a boat moored there this seemed to be positive proof that the wodonga was close at hand for silent billy generally went out in his boat to catch the rope thrown to him from the steamer which having made fast to one of the seats he rowed with it back to the wharf this was a necessary operation to enable the wodonga to swing round and back into the wharf silent billy pulled out from the wharf and no sooner had he done so than a boom was heard followed by a sharp whistle that's the wodonga round in the point billy was right he's a wonderful man is billy said one of the men on the wharf they watched silent billy slowly pulling out into the stream then the faint outline of a big steamer was seen in the darkness and presently her saloon lights were visible gleaming out from her huge side a man stood in the bow of the steamer with a rope coiled in his hand ready to throw to billy in the boat he was about to fling it was suddenly seen to fall back off his seat and sprawl in the bottom of his boat what's up billy 
yelled the man on the steamer. Silent Billy scrambled quickly up and looked over the side of his boat. He made a grab at something floating in the water. The old fellow shuddered as his fingers clutched the saturated clothes of a drowned man. Man overboard! Hold hard! shouted Billy. Wait till I get him aboard! He tugged hard at the body, but failed to drag it into his boat. Seeing it was impossible to do this, he made the body fast with a piece of rope to the stern of his boat, and then signalled to the man on the steamer to fling his rope to him. When the end came whizzing into the boat with a thud, Silent Billy commenced to row back to the wharf. The people on the wharf all crowded to the side to see the object Billy had in tow. His mishap had been seen from the wharf, and many were the surmises as to the cause of Silent Billy, who was such a good oarsman, catching a crab. Billy slung the rope of the steamer onto the wharf, and then said, Give us a hand with this poor devil, afore she comes alongside and swamps us. The body of the unfortunate man was hauled onto the wharf, and carried under the sheds until the arrival of the water police. Only a dim light shone on the wharf, and the face of the drowned man was scarcely visible. The Wodonga came alongside, and one of the first passengers to come ashore was Dr. Langside. He had seen what occurred from the deck of the Wodonga, and hurried ashore to see if he could be of any assistance. Dr. Langside followed Silent Billy to the sheds, and here he found two men in the familiar uniform of the water police, looking seriously at the body. They recognised Dr. Langside, who was well known in Sydney, and one of them said, "'This is a sad business, Doctor. I'm afraid there's been foul play.' "'Do you know who it is?' asked the Doctor. "'Yes, sir, and so do you, I expect. Luke.' and the policeman drew a handkerchief off the drowned man's face. Dr. Langside started back in amazement. "'Good heavens!' he exclaimed. "'It's Henry Price! Whatever does this mean?' He at once proceeded to examine the body of the unfortunate Henry Bryce, who, but a few short hours before, had been full of life and health, and eager to fight his election battles again. "'Dead, undoubtedly!' said Dr. Langside. Look here, Williams, he's been struck a heavy blow on the back of the head. This blow was enough to render him insensible. He must have been knocked down and pushed into the water, or have been struck when near the edge of the wharf and fallen in. Looks like a case of murder, said W.P. Constable Williams. There will have to be an inquest, said the doctor. Word had better be sent to his house, said the constable. I will go there myself, said Dr. Langside. I know Miss Bryce well. And as Dr. Langside drove in a cab to the residence of the Bryces at Pops Point, he thought of the unfortunate man lying dead on the wharf, and muttered to himself, It's a mysterious affair. I wonder how it will turn out. When young Ted Bryce hears of this, there'll be a day of reckoning for someone, sooner or later. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two of Who Did It」by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. No Trace When Ida Bryce and her stepmother returned from the theatre, they found Henry Bryce had not arrived. It was after eleven, but Ida was not anxious about her father, as he said he might return late. Twelve o'clock struck, and he had not returned and even Mrs. Bryce commenced to feel uneasy. She was a selfish woman, with hardly a thought for others, but Henry Bryce had been such an indulgent husband that he had aroused what small amount of feeling there was in her. "'I wish your father would come, Ida,' she said. "'I have never known him to be so late.' "'He ought not to have gone on a night like this,' replied Ida. "'He is so venturesome, and he always refuses to have the carriage to meet him.' They sat looking at the clock on the mantelpiece, until it was just on the stroke of one, when Ida Bryce started from her seat and said, "'There's a cab coming up the drive. I am glad he has returned.' 
I'm tired and want to go to bed. That play was so dull it nearly sent me to sleep. Ida Bryce, in her anxiety to welcome her father home, rushed out of the room into the hall just as the door was opened. When she saw Dr. Langside, she turned white and gasped. My father, where is he? Why are you here? Is anything the matter, Dr. Langside? As a medical man, Dr. Langside had been placed in many painful and difficult positions, but as he looked at Ida's face, he thought he had never had such a hard task set him before. He knew how Henry Bryce was beloved by his children, and he dreaded the effect of the terrible news he had to tell upon a girl of Ida's temperament. "'Your mother up, Miss Bryce?' he asked in order to gain a moment's respite. "'My stepmother is in the dining-room,' said Ida. "'But where's my father? Have you seen him? Has he met with an accident? Is he hurt?' "'I've seen your father,' he said quietly, "'and he has met with an accident. "'Come into the dining-room and I will tell you both about it.' His tone of voice somewhat reassured Ida, and she led the way into the dining-room. "'Father has met with an accident,' she said. "'Dr. Langside is here. He has seen him.' Mrs. Bryce looked startled, but she received the news more calmly than Ida. Dr. Langside shook hands with her, and then, standing, looked gravely at them. "'Where did it happen? Tell me all about it,' said Mrs. Bryce. "'I only arrived from Brisbane by the Wodonga tonight,' commenced Dr. Langside. "'When I stepped onto the wharf, my services were required to attend a man who had been in the water.' He looked closely at Ida Bryce. He knew she would be more nearly affected than Mrs. Bryce. "'You can imagine how shocked I was when I discovered it was your father, Miss Bryce, who had met with an accident. I attended to him at once. I did all I possibly could for him.' "'Go on,' said Ida Bryce, in a hollow voice. Mrs. Bryce was also much agitated. "'I'm sorry to say your father has met with a very serious accident. I doubt if he will recover,' he said, hesitatingly. "'You have no doubts?' said Ida slowly. "'You know he will not recover.' Dr. Langside bowed his head in acknowledgment. Ida Bryce stepped up to him and clasped his arm. "'Is my father dead?' she said with a shudder. "'Ida, how can you?' came from Mrs. Bryce. Dr. Langside took Ida Bryce by the hand and said quietly, "'Miss Bryce, your father is dead. He was dead when I saw him.' Mrs. Bryce uttered a piercing scream, and proceeded to moan in a most lamentable fashion, rocking herself to and fro and wringing her hands. Ida Bryce merely sank down into a chair, and seemed dazed and crushed. She hardly realised the blow she had received. Dr. Langside wished she would burst into tears, but her eyes remained dry. Her grief was too deep even for tears to flow freely. Dr. Langside remained in the house all night. In the morning he found Ida Bryce better. That she was still suffering terribly, he could see, and he endeavoured to rouse her. "'I will at once send a wire to your brother,' he said. "'Is he on the station?' "'Yes, at Munda Station,' said Ida. "'Please meet him at the railway station when he arrives and explain to him. "'Poor Ted! It will be an awful blow to him!' "'How long will it take him to reach here?' asked Dr. Langside. "'He will not arrive until tomorrow," said Ida. "'The inquest will be held to-day,' said Dr. Langside. "'After it is over, your father will be brought home.' Ida shuddered. The mere thought of an inquest being held over her dead father was an additional blow. "'It is necessary,' said Dr. Langside. "'There may have been foul play. I'm sure your brother will be anxious to hear the truth.' "'Foul play?' said Ida. "'What do you mean? My father had not an enemy in the world.' "'He may have had one, Miss Bryce, and it may be that one who has caused his death. "'You'll see it all in the papers, so I may as well tell you. "'I believe your father was struck down by a violent blow on the head, "'and then either fell or was thrown into the water.' "'Oh, this is dreadful,' moaned Ida. 
and to think i was at the theatre last night laughing and enjoying myself at the very time she sobbed hysterically you cannot blame yourself for that miss bryce he said kindly every one knows what an affectionate daughter you were and how dearly you loved your father after a short conversation dr langside left her and promised to return when the inquest was over mrs bryce appeared inconsolable she made a far greater outward show of grief than ida she was genuinely sorry for her husband's death but as the day wore on she became equally anxious on her own account and wondered how henry bryce had made his will the inquest was held the morning papers had gathered particulars about the accident and the community at large felt a severe shock at the death of such a well-known and much respected man as henry bryce as the inquest proceeded and the news appeared in the evening papers it was discovered that what had befallen henry bryce was no accident but would probably at the conclusion be called by the much uglier word of murder one of the evening papers in an early edition alluded to the supposed murder of mr henry bryce the same paper even went so far as to crow over its rivals in a later edition and went on to point out how they had first published the fact that mr henry bryce was murdered it was not even thought indecorous to make capital out of the dead man and the sub-editor was complimented by his chief on his foresight and acumen in being the first in the field with such an important piece of news nothing sensational was brought out at the inquest the coroner tried to look wise and put on an air of importance he did not get such a man as the late henry bryce to sit upon every day in the week he felt that this was no ordinary case and consequently prolonged it and gloated over it in a manner that surprised even the reporters and it takes a lot to surprise a pressman had the inquest been on the body of tom smith wharf labourer the coroner would have apologised for calling the jury together and explained that it was merely a matter of form and hinted that the sooner they got through with it the better it is surprising what a vast difference there is between a wharf labourer and a millionaire even when death is supposed to have levelled all ranks so the coroner puffed himself out with windy dignity and reproved a juryman for levity when he sneezed and actually threatened to order him out of court if the offence was repeated as the atmosphere of the court was somewhat ticklish to sensitive nostrils the juryman may be pardoned for his breach of decorum dr langside never had much respect for the coroner and what little he had vanished before the inquest on poor henry bryce was over the coroner cross-questioned witnesses as to the as to the private relations of the deceased with his family he even went so far as to say the inquest ought to be adjourned in order that edward bryce might be present the fact of edward bryce being five hundred miles from sydney at the time weighed not an atom with the coroner after deliberating for some minutes he kindly consented out of deference to the feelings of the deceased's family to waive the point of edward bryce's presence dr langside felt inclined to wave his fist in the coroner's face and looked so contemptuously at him that the coroner asked him if he wished to make any further remarks as dr langside had already given his evidence and been recalled five times he candidly admitted he could throw no more light on the subject the coroner summed up this was his chance he summarized the evidence he dilated for fully an hour on the salient points of the case he flung arguments at the jury with such rapidity and inaccurate aim as to the points he intended to make that the good men and true were bathed in perspiration and bewilderment having exhausted his skirmishers he brought up his heavy reserves and said gentlemen i will now read over the evidence the jurymen glanced at the piles of foolscap and one of the gentlemen groaned audibly the coroner heard him and said in a sympathetic manner that it was a painful scene and he fully endorsed the groan of the affected juryman at last the inquest came to an end 
and the jury returned a verdict of wilful murder against some person or persons unknown the coroner said that was a rather large order but the jury felt it was their turn and declined to amend their verdict henry bryce's funeral was an enormous procession and although scores of people followed who had never spoken to the dead man in their lives they had known him by repute as an upright man edward bryce herbert golding and dr langside were the chief mourners and occupied the first coach in after years this incident was brought vividly to the minds of two of them edward bryce was terribly shocked at the news of his father's death he could not understand it like his sister he did not believe his father had an enemy in the world once however the bare fact was brought home to him that his father had met with foul play it was as dr langside had thought young bryce was determined there should be a day of reckoning for the man or men who had killed his father the police did their best the police as a rule do their duty and get very little credit for it they got none in this case the reporters badgered them for information and when the police informed them quite truthfully that they had no information to give the papers stated the police declined to give us information but believe they have a clue which will lead to the apprehension of the perpetrator of the crime when the police read this they were mad there was no clue the chief would have given a year's salary of the best police reporter in sydney to have obtained even the smallest bit of a clue but the papers were so persistent in saying that the police had a clue that the detectives in charge of the case began to think there must originally have been a clue and that it had been lost edward bryce was anxious about this clue he offered five hundred pounds reward for information that would lead to the arrest and conviction of his father's assailant or assailants that five hundred pounds made the police hunt for clues in all sorts of impossible and improbable directions how it got about no one knew but a rumour commenced to circulate that the union shearers had something to do with henry bryce's untimely death no more scandalous rumour was ever circulated said the union men it was a political dodge to damage the labour party at the general election edward bryce did not believe the unionist shearers were responsible for the outrage and he said so openly the men applauded him and swore there should be no more trouble at munda station next shearing how they kept their word will be seen later on there was no trace of the man or men who had attacked henry bryce and the police honestly confessed the whole affair was shrouded in mystery End of chapter 2。chapter 3 of Who Did It by Nat Gould。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。The New Member。Henry Bryce was not the man to die and leave no last will and testament behind him。His will was duly proved, and his executors were his son Edward、Herbert Golding。His partner and dr langside it was a surprise to dr langside when he heard that he was one of the executors he had attended the late mr bryce on more than one occasion but did not think that he had been regarded in any other light than an ordinary medical man herbert golding was not surprised he was made an executor but he was surprised when he found dr langside had also been appointed the appointment irritated him although he gave no outward sign it did so the will was an equitable one the bulk of the estate was divided between edward bryce and his sister ida the former taking munda and other stations and a large share in the firm of bryce golding and company mrs bryce had fifty thousand pound cash and the house furniture and effects at potts point on condition ida was allowed to reside there if she desired Dr. Langside and Herbert Golding received five hundred pounds each. Everyone was satisfied, although Mrs. Bryce expected more and said so. 
but the amount she received was too handsome for her to speak slightingly of it it became necessary to find a candidate to take henry bryce's place in balmain east constituency edward bryce was asked to take his father's place but he submitted he was too young and declined after some discussion in which heated arguments were advanced for and against for he was not a particularly popular man herbert golding was asked to stand after as he stated giving the matter his most serious consideration he consented herbert golding was a man with an immense opinion of his own importance carefully concealed behind a mask of outwardly pious and benevolent characteristics he was a very different man to his dead partner henry bryce it is surprising how two men directly opposite in character managed to hit it off well in business henry bryce was a bluff hearty hail-fellow well-met sort of man he made no boast of possessing religious principles he seldom went to church but he did not think he should be refused admittance to the abode of the just on that account he was probably right he lived honestly and did many kindly actions he hated hypocrisy and cant and towards the latter end of his life he commenced to think herbert golding was a bit of a humbug herbert golding was not a bad-looking man he was a bachelor about forty years of age or a few years younger and a favourite with the ladies he was tall had a good figure and looked a gentleman his face was clean-shaved and he had mild blue eyes which seemed to look benevolently on all mankind his smile was not fascinating it had something of the sneer in it had he cultivated a moustache it would have been a decided sneer he was very particular in his dress he always wore dark clothes and they were always of the best but cut in an unassuming fashion herbert golding always wore a top hat even in the intense heat of summer he would not discard his shiny beaver he attended church regularly in fact was a shining light and acted as vicar's church warden the congregation at the particular church he favoured with his presence looked up to him and regarded him as a model man the male members placed implicit confidence in him and took his advice on matters concerning their financial welfare the female members made a fuss of him there was no danger connected with such a moral man as herbert golding his vicar regarded his churchwarden as his right-hand man and relied upon him in everything herbert golding was one of the founders and chairman of the directors of the amalgamated land and investment banking and financial company a long name but herbert golding was fond of high-sounding titles and he had bestowed the name upon the company himself he had wished to add half a dozen more words to the name of the company but when a director pointed out that special envelopes would have to be made in order to get the address on he gave way amalgamated land and investment banking and financial company he refused to budge from and the name was adopted the company flourished exceedingly and gave ten per cent to depositors herbert golding was regarded as a munificent benefactor to the human race of modest investors henry bryce declined to have any share in this company and he was lamentably deficient in common sense so his partner said for not investing a few thousands on fixed deposit at ten per cent when herbert golding pressed the matter henry bryce had said ten per cent eh golding that's very nice for the depositors if it lasts but how about the poor devils your company lends money to what interest do you charge them to pay ten per cent on fixed deposits and clear working expenses no golding that company won't suit me get some of your congregational friends to invest in it i dare say your parson would put in a trifle the black cloth gentry are desperately keen on ten per cent herbert golding had replied as you like but i can assure you it's a capital investment and a safer concern as there is in sydney such a highly respectable man as herbert golding must stand a good chance for balmain east said his supporters 
although somewhat prosy in his style herbert golding was not a bad speaker he had a good voice and a convincing way of putting things he held out the part he had taken in establishing the amalgamated land and investment etc company as a sop to the labour party and the working men stating the company had been established mainly to benefit the workers who could now obtain a large percentage for their small savings he had nothing to do with shearing strikes in fact he was in favour of unionism he eulogised the late henry bryce but said he could not agree with him on the labour question herbert golding had no hesitation in using his dead partner's name as a lever wherewith to hoist himself into the legislative assembly there was not much time in which to work the electorate but herbert golding did his best he was here there and everywhere and it was surprising the number of people holding exactly opposite views that he agreed with on one point he remained firm much to the disgust of the committee he would have nothing to do with the licensed victuallers he went dead against them and in favour of the local option without compensation he had his reward the next sunday when at church as the vicar pointedly alluded to him in his discourse and held him up as a man who would not pander to the vices of the community after service he was congratulated on all sides after his dinner a remarkably good one for a bachelor he uncorked a bottle of his favourite port and smiled success to temperance herbert golding preferred to be esteemed morally rather than politically when the day of the election came herbert golding felt anxious as to the result if he won in the face of his opposition to the l v a it would be a great moral victory if defeated he could assume a resigned attitude and point to the vile influence that had been at work against him he was not defeated he was triumphant he smote the labour candidate and the l v a candidate hip and thigh he was surprised at his success he headed the poll by a large majority that bryce affair did it said the labour members herbert golding cared very little what circumstances had assisted in placing him at the head of the poll he was a member for balmain east and that was enough for him he could add m l a after his name and write his letters from that wonderful menagerie known as the parliament buildings in macquarie street he was a member of the legislative assembly a lawmaker a power in the land he could feather his own nest out of the pickings in the treasury if there were any left and he would be paid three hundred pound a year by a confiding people for doing it the mere thought of this made herbert golding look more pious and benevolent than ever and his blue eyes fairly gleamed with sympathy for suffering humanity truly it was a veritable triumph and the righteous had prospered the morning papers congratulated balmain east on possessing such an admirable representative poor henry bryce whose body was hardly cold in its grave was forgotten he might have been dead years one paper hinted that such a man as herbert golding could not long be kept out of the ministry herbert golding read all these notices he actually purchased a book for newspaper cuttings and pasted them in such testimonials to his worth ought not he felt be lost to posterity the new member was elated he had forgotten all about his dead partner before edward bryce returned to munda station he had gone thoroughly into his father's affairs and dr langside had assisted him considerably herbert golding was extremely obliging and showed every consideration to the family of his late partner he was to have sole management of the firm in sydney as edward bryce said he did not care for a town life ida bryce decided to remain with her stepmother for a time but she confided to her brother she did not think it would be for long we shall not agree ted she said when i find the situation irksome i intend to apply to you for a situation as housekeeper at munda come whenever you like ida he said the place has never been the same since you left old wideawake says you were the only cheerful object within a radius of forty miles 
poor old wide awake said ida what an honest old fellow he is i'm sure there's a mystery about that man ted he's not always been a station hand i don't think he has said ted bryce he's an amusing old chap and he's well named he's a sharp customer and i like him and he's fond of you but who could help being so she added all the good qualities i may happen to possess i inherit from dear old dad said ted bryce sorrowfully was there ever such another man in the world no he was indeed a good kind father said his sister in a broken voice oh if i could only lay my hands on the man who murdered him said her brother clenching his fists it will come to light some day i want nothing better than to stand face to face with the man who struck him down then you're quite sure it was murder said ida yes said ted bryce i'm certain of it and so is dr langside in that case vengeance will surely overtake the man who did the deed said ida End of chapter three chapter four of who did it by nat gould this librivox recording is in the public domain munda munda station was about five hundred miles west from sydney on the western line it was an immense station covering about forty square miles of country louth was the nearest township and bourke about ninety miles distant the nearest railway station munda was not a particularly enchanting place but it was a good station in a season when rain was plentiful about a hundred and thirty thousand sheep was an average shearing young edward bryce at his own request had been appointed manager at munda with several experienced men under him like his sister he preferred the country to the town and when he visited sydney he always felt stifled in the city and was not sorry when the time came for him to return to munda and comparative solitude town-bred men can never understand the charm of the lonely life some men lead on stations they would die of ennui in less than a month they cannot enter into or share the peculiar delight these station men out in the back blocks of australia take in their existence edward bryce had he so wished could have been a man about town with a place in his father's business house more as an excuse for an occupation than anything else his father would have made him an ample allowance but edward bryce was not built that way he did not mean to lead an idle useless life merely because his father had made money he was not a fop and had no inclination to do the block in pitt street and ogle the fair maidens of sydney who exposed their charms there dangling after the girls he considered not exactly a waste of time but a neglecting of opportunities yet edward bryce was no confirmed bachelor he was not a selfish man and nine out of every ten unmarried men are selfish on one of his trips to sydney he made the acquaintance of miss flora hanworth a sister of wyndham hanworth a well-known australian artist who was a great friend of edward bryce's if there was one thing ted bryce loved more than any other it was pictures he was fond of visiting the art gallery in sydney and one day he was pointing out to his sister what he considered a mistake in a bush scene signed w h the man who painted that is an artist said ted bryce but he's made a mistake i never saw a sheep lie down like that in my life and i've seen some hundreds of thousands drop down both from a desire to do so from exhaustion and from death i wish i had w h at munda for a week i'd soon prove to him where he was wrong he's a clever fellow all the same but i'll bet he never painted that sheep from life you're perfectly correct said a melodious voice behind them which made edward bryce and his sister turn round hurriedly they saw a good-looking man of about thirty smiling kindly at them ida bryce saw at a glance that he had a mobile face a heavy dark moustache clear dark eyes was not tall but carried himself well and looked as he had spoken like an educated man of the world i did not paint that sheep from life he added then i presume you are w h the painter of that picture said edward bryce he spoke without the least embarrassment 
and the artist at once liked him for it had edward bryce commenced to make apologies for criticising the picture the painter would have formed an unfavourable opinion of him i am my name is wyndham hanworth he said i heard your remarks they are perfectly just that sheep is the blot in the picture did you hear all i said asked ted bryce yes i could not resist the temptation of listening to an unbiased criticism of my work said wyndham hanworth then will you accept my invitation and come to munda and study sheep asked ted bryce with a frank smile with pleasure said the artist it is too kind of you to invite me not at all it will be a pleasure to me to have a real live artist on the premises i am very fond of pictures good pictures i mean not like that and he pointed to an impossible figure of an undraped woman ida bryce had time to observe the artist closely during this conversation and she thought she would like him she did like him when she knew him well and that meeting in the art gallery had sealed a lasting friendship between the bryces and the hanworths wyndham hanworth was not one of those men who did not believe in criticism but he knew when a critic was up to his work he knew also there were faults in his pictures and he was only too glad to have them pointed out to him by men who knew more than he did it does not follow that a man need be an artist to criticise pictures or an actor to criticise acting or an author to review books yet there are painters actors and authors who declare that they do not believe in criticisms even go so far as to say they never read them how can you judge of the worth of criticism if you never read criticisms asked wyndham hanworth of a brother artist and the question remained unanswered because it is unanswerable the man who places himself above criticism is seldom worth being criticised wyndham hanworth must be left to himself for the present munda station and edward bryce demand attention when edward bryce reached munda on his return from his father's funeral in sydney he felt for the first time in his life the loneliness of his surroundings it seemed to him he missed his father's presence although henry bryce seldom visited munda during the last few years of his life his son always felt his absent father's presence about the homestead i must have a mate here for a time he mused i never felt this depression before but it is not to be wondered at when i think how dear old dad died and that i could not see him alive once more edward bryce called his father dad it might sound childish to the modern young man but when edward bryce said dad there was a world of affection in his voice and there was not a man in all australia who would have cared to hint the use of that word was ridiculous henry bryce had always been dad to his children and such endearing terms as the governor the old fossil the pater or the old man were not familiar in the bryce family i wonder if wyndham would come and take compassion on me he went on it will be shearing time soon and i fancy he would be able to paint a good picture with a shearing shed for a model hang it all i'll try him it takes a letter such a time to reach sydney i'll send a wire hello there yes yeah, sir what is it oh it's you wide awake is it said ted as a man stood in the doorway i want to send a telegram to sydney at once tell one of the lads to saddle up yes yeah, sir said the man the telegram's to mr hanworth said ted you remember him rather right said wide awake he's a real good sort and he's a first-class artist so he is said ted i'm asking him to come and spend a few weeks with me i feel a bit lonely no wonder said wide awake shaking his head and come back here and keep me company said ted bryce when you've seen the telegram sent off wide awake disappeared i wonder who the deuce that man is said ted bryce to himself old wide awake and he's not an old man by any means it is the only name he's ever been known by here he's about the best man we have on munda and that's a large order wide awake returned and ted bryce asked him to sit down and have a pipe handing him his pouch at the same time there is considerably more freedom between master and man on an australian station than between men of similar standing in the old country 
on a big station are occasionally found broken down swells not in health but in pocket who are by no means depressed at their unlucky turn of fortune's wheel and who to their credit be it said often turn out real good men old wide awake as he was called had been picked up by ted bryce at burke during the race week young bryce had taken a fancy to old wide awake's looks and engaged him as a general hand about the homestead the man interested him and although he declined to give any name or the least information as to his antecedents or where he came from the young squatter had no reason to regret the trust he placed in him it is an awful thing this murder of my father said ted bryce news is slow in finding its way to these back country spots and wide awake although he knew of henry bryce's death did not know of the manner in which he had come to an untimely end murdered said wide awake you surely do not mean to say your father met with foul play such a man as your father could not have many enemies there can be no doubt unfortunately about the foul play replied ted he had a terrible blow on the back of his head which knocked him insensible dr langside says he was either knocked into the water or thrown in afterwards very strange said wide awake and have the police no clue was he robbed no said ted he was not robbed there was no motive of gain in the mind of the man who did the deed at least no immediate gain by robbery that is the strange part of the affair my father had attended an election meeting he was the candidate on our side for balmain east it was as he returned from the meeting he was attacked some people were inclined to blame the union men for it but i do not hold that opinion the unionists go too far sometimes but i do not think they would commit a cowardly act like that they'd fire a shed and poison non-unionists said wide awake that has been done ted bryce was silent he knew such things had taken place but still he did not think the men would treacherously murder an old man in cold blood excited by rioting they might commit desperate acts but this was a different matter altogether will anyone benefit by your father's death asked wide awake no one outside the family herbert golding his partner in the firm retains his portion and is now manager he has also been elected member for balmain east in place of my father they asked me to stand but i declined i think it only reasonable that mr golding should have been put in then the whole affair's a mystery said wide awake yes replied ted i've offered a reward of five hundred pounds for information that will lead to the conviction of the murderer i've an idea something may be gleaned about it during next shearing said wide awake how said ted surprised well you see we get a lot of all sorts of men around munda at that time and if you adopt your father's plan and decline to shear under union rules we shall have a very mixed lot indeed here and a heap of ruffians who will loaf about and sponge on a union camp yes said ted what then these men talk a lot the death of your father is sure to crop up i'll keep my ears open and learn what they have to say something may leak out we can never tell even the faintest clue sometimes turns out strong when followed up i don't believe any of the shearers were responsible for my father's death said ted perhaps not but you know there are men who hang on to the union ranks who are out and out scoundrels it's these men who commit all the outrages and the union men suffer for it said wide awake perhaps you're right said ted but where's the motive for such an outrage if we could discover the motive the perpetrator of the crime might be traced depend upon it the man or men who murdered your father were instigated to commit the crime by some individual desirous of getting rid of him said wide awake that may be so said ted but i have no idea who could possibly be anxious to remove my father time alone may reveal that said wide awake i do not believe crimes such as this are allowed to go unpunished sooner or later the evil doer is unmasked the longer his crime remains undiscovered the greater his punishment he carries about with him a load of guilt that crushes him down his burden becomes greater than he can bear and as he can confide in no one 
gets no one to share the weight of his terrible secret at last he voluntarily confesses his guilt i've often read of cases where men confess to a murder after years of silence death to them is preferable to carrying their frightful load of guilt and they have no dread of the scaffold no man ever sinned and remained unpunished his punishment may not be publicly known but he suffers torture in secret he is condemned by himself by the weight of evidence he adduces against himself and upon which he convicts himself to years of misery worse than mere imprisonment or death a guilty man at liberty sees in each fellow man a possible accuser he lives in daily hourly dread of the arresting hand upon his shoulder he looks at his fellow men in the face in fear and trembling believe me a guilty man at liberty is more bound and fettered than a man who lawfully suffers for his crime ted bryce looked hard at wide awake as he spoke these words vehemently and with some emotion yours must have been a strange life said ted it has said wide awake i know what a guilty man must suffer because i have borne the burden of a guilt not my own i know how i have suffered being guiltless what then must be the suffering of a man knowing himself guilty of a crime for which an innocent man is blamed ted bryce placed his hand on old wide awake's shoulder and looked him in the face i believe what you say he said i know i can trust you keep your name and your secret i do not want to learn either but remember this if ever you want a friend to assist you think of me and i will not fail you there's my hand on it wide awake god bless you said wide awake as he grasped ted bryce's hand then he turned and left the room End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of Who Did It by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Artist. When Wyndham Hanworth received Edward Bryce's telegram, he at once sent a reply that he would leave Sydney for Munda in a couple of days. Wyndham Hanworth was rapidly advancing in his profession, which he dearly loved, and several of his pictures had fetched fair prices. Before he left for Munda, he called to see Ida Bryce. Ida was always pleased to see him. She admired him and wished she could assist him in his work. She was also very fond of Flora Hanworth, who kept house for her brother, as they were orphans and had earned their own living for several years. She knew her brother was partial to Flora, and she did not wonder at it, for the artist's sister was an amiable, attractive girl, of a refined disposition, and well-educated. "'I'm glad to see you, Mr. Hanworth,' said Ida. "'You are quite a stranger. It seems ages since I saw you last.' Wyndham Hanworth smiled as he replied. "'Not ages, Miss Bryce. I called here three weeks ago.' "'Ah,' said Ada, with a sigh, "'poor old Dad was alive then.' His death has been, and still is, hardly realised by me. I seem to fancy he will return home at any moment. No one could have been more shocked or have sympathised with you more deeply than my sister and myself. I owe much of my success to your father, Miss Bryce. He purchased several of my pictures, and that assisted me at a critical time, said Wyndham. My father admired your work. He did not profess to be a judge of painting, but he bought pictures that pleased him. I should never buy a picture myself, because a certain artist painted it. I should always buy the picture that gave me the most pleasure to look at, said Ida. There you are right, said the artist. I often think that the gaudy coloured pictures we see in a humble dwelling give the occupants as much pleasure or more than a nobleman's gallery affords him. But I did not come here to talk shop, Miss Bryce, he added. I have received a telegram from your brother. He says he feels lonely at Munda and asks me to go and spend a week or two with him. "'And you will go?' said Ida eagerly. "'Yes, Miss Bryce. I can understand his feelings. I leave tomorrow. said Wyndham Hanworth. "'You are my brother's best friend,' said Ida. "'I am anxious about him. He seems altered since Dad's death. I am afraid he will never rest until he has traced out the perpetrators of the outrage.' "'I will do all in my power to rouse him,' said Wyndham. 
i shall also be able to obtain some sketches the shearing will be on soon and i may perhaps be persuaded to remain until it commences i do hope you will said ida i will ask flora to stay with me here until your return that is very kind of you he said i shall be glad to know she is left in such safe hands she is a most delightful companion said ida mrs bryce came into the room and wyndham shook hands with her he did not like mrs bryce like many other people he could never understand henry bryce marrying her when mrs bryce heard he was going to munda she merely said give my love to edward i hope you will have a pleasant visit perhaps he has some pet horses or dogs or a tame kangaroo he wants you to paint for him edward always appears to place animals on a higher level than human beings perhaps it is because he is associated with them more i think ted likes animals said ida quietly because they are true and faithful to people who are kind to them in my short experience i have often found human beings are seldom grateful and often sneer at people who are unselfish enough to do them good turns wyndham hanworth felt it was time to make his adieu and accordingly did so ida bryce went to the door with him and said my stepmother i am afraid is not overwhelmed with love for either ted or myself be sure if ted asks you say i am quite contented here i feel it is my duty to remain for a time but i do not think i can bear it much longer wyndham hanworth understood her and merely said he would do as she wished ida said mrs bryce when she returned to the room i cannot understand why you make such a fuss of a man in mr hanworth's position he is an artist said ida he is also a gentleman i do not make a fuss of him he would be the first to resent fussiness from any one he is not a suitable companion for a girl in your position said mrs bryce a painter a man who paints sheep and bush scenes and huts and hovels and such things my father sold sheep and bush scenes and huts and hovels and such things said ida don't talk nonsense ida your father was a stock and station agent not a painter said mrs bryce we shall not agree on the subject said ida so let it rest my father did not object to wyndham hanworth your father often made acquaintance outside his own circle that it would have been better for him had he not done so said mrs bryce ida bryce was about to reply in a manner that would have caused mrs bryce to fly into a passion by hinting that her stepmother was one of the undesirable acquaintances in question she refrained however and merely said i shall ask flora hanworth to stay with me during her brother's absence if you have no objection but i have objection said mrs bryce flora hanworth is beneath you in social position not at all said ida she is a lady there are no lower grades in the ranks of ladies i will not have flora hanworth staying in my house said mrs bryce and i am afraid i shall have to go and stay with flora said ida i have no doubt we shall manage very well together in fact i should rather enjoy it i forbid you to do anything of the kind said mrs bryce if flora does not come here i shall most certainly go there if she will have me said ida mrs bryce knew ida well and had not the least doubt she would do as she said your father spoils both you and edward said mrs bryce he was the best father that ever lived said ida dear old dad ida do not be so absurd absurd said ida yes calling your father dad it is childish said mrs bryce then i shall always remain childish said ida he was dad to me alive he is dad to me now more than ever you cannot understand it is useless for me to explain all that simple word means to me ida left the room feeling she could not keep her tears back wyndham hanworth left by the night mail for burke it was a tedious journey and he was heartily tired of the train when it steamed into burke station he took the coach to louth and there edward bryce met him with a buggy and pair you're a good fellow to take compassion on my loneliness win said ted bryce i know what an awful drag that five hundred miles of a railway journey is especially in this sort of weather 
i can tell you old man we're in for a scorcher at monday yesterday it was over a hundred under the veranda a hot welcome ted said the artist a very hot welcome all the same i'm glad to see you have you brought your tackle with you said ted fishing tackle asked wyndham now you're better at catching expressions and finishing touches than fishes you know what i mean all the cargo into the buggy or perhaps i'd better send a wagon for the stock in trade if it's very bulky don't chaff ted it does not become you be serious and sober-minded and drive me at a steady pace to munda mind i distinctly said at a steady pace the last time those greys flew over the ground i believe they are the very pair is there an accident insurance office handy he asked i'll not kill you win said ted laughing i'll strap you in if you prefer it joking apart i'll go steady in deference to your shattered city nervous system fifteen miles an hour how will that suit you halve it my boy halve it said wyndham fifteen miles an hour i shall be a thing of shreds and patches long before we reach munda if you drive at that pace by this time hanworth's baggage was put in the buggy and in a few minutes they were off how those greys could travel they disdained to trot and preferred a good gallop when their master was willing they seemed to revel in the exercise and the buggy and its occupants did not trouble them in the least this is glorious said the artist with evident satisfaction beats your towns hollow said ted yes replied his companion there's plenty of scope here and he waved his hand for miles and miles there was nothing but open country the grass was fast being burnt up with the scorching sun turning to a dingy brown and already cracks were to be seen in the baked ground still the want of rain had not been severely felt as yet it was a wonderful sight this vast tract of land level as a billiard-table on every side i wish some rain would come said ted bryce it will be getting serious in another couple of weeks the river is low but navigable still that will not last long and we know what to expect when the darling dries up want of water is the great drawback here said the artist what a paradise this place would be if the rain could be depended upon how do these artesian bores act very well but we cannot get them on this side of the river the nature of the ground will not allow it they have them on dunlop and there has been an immense supply of water from them i believe one or two are nearly exhausted and the remainder are shortening in supply for my own part i do not think they are permanent i wish they were it would be a grand thing for the country if these bores were inexhaustible said wyndham yes replied ted they are however wonderful even now and who knows in time what further discoveries may be made when do you commence shearing asked wyndham probably next week we are hurrying up because if the drought gets very bad it will stop us said ted i want you to paint a picture of our shearing shed win i'm sure you would make a big hit with it there's such a variety in it for you and it would be a real australian scene you may see some fun here i'm not going to sign the union agreement and i fancy munda will be made a test shed i thought the union men swore there would be no trouble at munda again when you disbelieved the rumours circulated that your father's death was caused by some of these men said wyndham the men were sincere when they said it replied ted but the union is all-powerful and unionists must obey orders no matter what their own particular intentions may be but that's tyranny said wyndham exactly so replied ted there are no more tyrannical men on the face of the earth than the unionist leaders i think they do not understand freedom of contract because they have no freedom amongst themselves i do not blame the men for all the trouble and strikes i blame their leaders many of these leaders are nothing more than paid agitators frothy-mouthed windbags men who fatten on agitation and live well on union funds i do not say all are alike but i know some leaders of the unionists who brag of their influence and sneer at the men they dupe why not sign the unionist agreement asked wyndham would it not save trouble yes said ted bryce but i believe as my father did that every man has a right to employ who he likes to do his work i will give them union wages but i shall decline to be bound down to employ none but union men i think you are right said the artist what a pity there is not more harmony between employers and employed 
i expect there is a good deal of obstinacy on each side obstinate i may be said ted bryce but i believe in freedom unionism does not give men freedom for it makes them slaves it deprives a man of the right to think and act for himself but look win there's manda and we will drop this subject you can see how it works for yourself if there's trouble over the shearing the greys dashed along at a great pace they knew they were near home union or non-union arguments troubled them not they were happy under the control of their master acknowledging his kindness and never feeling their subjection manda said wyndham howarth hurrah for manda we're far from the madding crowd here at all events wait and see said ted bryce there's the shearers camp over yonder you'll see a crowd there that will amuse you and furnish you with a whole portfolio full of sketches End of chapter 5「Who Did It」by Nat Gould This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Two Girls The battle royal had taken place, and Mrs. Bryce suffered defeat. Ida Bryce gained the day, and Flora Hanworth was a visitor at Potts Point. Of course, Flora knew nothing of what had taken place, or she would have been the very least person to have accepted the invitation. If Flora Hanworth was poor, it only made her prouder, and more susceptible to the least slight. She knew how Ida was situated regarding her stepmother, and Flora had accepted the invitation more for Ida's sake than her own. Mrs. Bryce felt compelled to act amicably if she did not feel amiable. She was rather afraid of Ida, and dreaded a scene if she was not as polite as a hostess should be to Flora Hanworth. Still, she could not prevent an occasional sarcastic remark, and Flora Hanworth was quick to notice the least slight. "'I do not think Mrs. Bryce cares for me to be here,' she said to Ida. "'Whatever induces you to think so,' replied Ida, with well-feigned surprise. "'Because of certain remarks she has made,' said Flora. "'My dear Flora, you must take no notice of Mrs. Bryce's little peculiarities. "'She does not mean anything. "'She only tries to be effective and to say smart things,' said Ida. "'At my expense,' said Flora. "'Smart things are generally said at the expense of someone,' said Ida. "'I assure you, Mrs. Bryce gives me very little rest. "'She uses me as a target to fire her shots at, "'but I'm afraid they do not very often hit the mark.' "'Ida!' you are not happy here said flora gently i can see that is there anything i can do for you be of any help to you i shall never be happy in this house said ida sadly it is not so much mrs bryce's manner to me as the thoughts of how much i have lost here that renders it unbearable you will go to your brother when you leave here said flora taking it for granted ida would change her residence before long yes replied ida he has promised to give me a situation as housekeeper at Munda. Flora smiled and coloured slightly, as she thought that she would not mind being permanently installed as housekeeper to Edward Bryce. "'I'm sure the situation would suit you admirably,' she said. "'What fun it would be if we both went to Munda while your brother is there,' said Ida. "'I'll write to Ted and ask him if he can accommodate us. He will not wait to reply by post. He will at once wire back.' by all means come immediately how can you ida said flora who was nevertheless pleased at such a prospect we could not possibly visit a house inhabited by two bachelors you forget mrs o'brien said ida with a laugh bridges is a perfect she-dragon she would guard us from all dangers and draw lurid pictures of the consequences of too close an intimacy with young men mrs o'brien has been in charge at munda for years she looks after ted as though he was still a child good old bridget she nursed us both she is a large-hearted irish woman and mrs o'brien is better known out west than any woman in the district mrs o'brien's presence certainly facilitates matters i agree with you ida it would be capital fun but what would mrs bryce say asked flora raise objections said ida she will point out that such conduct on the part of two hitherto respectable girls would be outrageous 
she would say it was indelicate i really believe she would hint that i had designs on wyndham and that you were about to lay siege to ted's young affections said ida with a sly glance at her companion flora was indignant or pretended to be ida thought the pretence predominated such things might be said about our visit said flora demurely it would be absurd of course i am no fonder of mr bryce than you are of wyndham i mean in that way oh you know what i mean she added as she saw her companion laughing but i am very fond of your brother said ida smiling and i am sure you like ted we should be a merry family mrs o'brien would preside at the table and see that we behaved like good boys and girls will you agree to go to munda with me if ted will have us and your brother will permit it if you wish it said flora but this is such a sudden freak whatever will mrs bryce say she will say a good deal replied ida and think a lot more than she says but mrs bryce will have to give in it may be wicked of me but i am beginning to thoroughly detest mrs bryce ida you must not say that said flora remember she was your father's choice that only makes matters worse said ida it is for that very reason i dislike her conduct this is not right it is not like you ida said flora oh you don't know all said ida if you realised what i feel you would not blame me she has insulted the memory of my father it is that makes her society unbearable to me what do you mean asked flora i mean that mrs bryce has so far forgotten what is due to my father's memory said ida that she encourages the attentions of a possible successor to him impossible you must be mistaken said flora shocked unfortunately there can be no mistake about it said ida he has called here several times who has called said flora mr golding said ida your father's partner said flora but he is one of the executors no doubt he comes to consult her on business matters that is what i thought at first said ida although i had my suspicions mrs bryce was far too familiar with mr golding when my father was alive accidentally i learned mr golding did not come here on business connected with my father's will he came here on business connected with my father's widow surely there must be some mistake said flora mrs bryce would never so far forget herself as to encourage another suitor for her hand and your father dead such a short time you do not understand mrs bryce said ida i do i tell you it makes my blood boil to see how she encourages mr golding but has he no sense of shame said flora no idea of what is right and proper he was your father's partner he is a very religious man or professes to be so surely he cannot be such a consummate hypocrite i never liked mr golding said ida he once actually proposed to me i have never forgiven him for that insult insult ida said flora surely it is not an insult for herbert golding to offer you his hand it was said ida passionately it was a gross insult he could not possess himself of mrs bryce so he magnanimously offered to make me mrs golding he got his answer you did not insult him i hope said flora oh no said ida i calmed my feelings as he was my father's partner i declined the honour i said he hardly knew what he was saying i put it down to the champagne but he is a staunch abstainer said flora so he said replied ida he said miss bryce i never drink anything stronger than water and what did you say ida i said then there can be no excuse for your conduct and bade him go replied ida does your brother know of this said flora no replied ida i did not tell ted it might have caused trouble and poor old dad hated scenes ted would probably have thrashed him had i told him all this is monstrous said flora i always understood from the vicar mr golding is such a devout trustworthy man i am afraid your vicar is deceived in him said ida mr golding's outward devotions are very different from his inward meditations ida i want you for a moment called mrs bryce the girls were seated on the veranda and mrs bryce's voice startled them ida at once went inside leaving flora in her chair 
mr golding is coming to dinner said mrs bryce looking at her keenly he has some business matters to talk over with me so i thought it only polite to ask him of course i should not have asked any one else so soon after my husband's death mr golding seems to have a considerable amount of business with you said ida of course i have no objection to his coming to dinner he's not my guest you are so peculiar in your ideas said mrs bryce i thought it better to tell you now perhaps you will think an idea i have at this particular moment is peculiar said ida it depends upon what it is said mrs bryce rather nervously i have been thinking how delightful it would be for flora and myself to go to munda for a week or two said ida mrs bryce wished nothing better than to have the house to herself but she pretended to be shocked at such a suggestion really ida i wonder what you will do next she said how can you possibly go to munda mr hanworth is there it would be positively indelicate i fail to see it said ida mrs o'brien is there and ted and flora would go with me i have no doubt she would said mrs bryce sarcastically your brother is there i see no greater impropriety in flora and myself visiting munda than i do in mr golding visiting you said ida and the accent on the you was pointed mrs bryce was angry her stepdaughter had such an unpleasant way of putting things the cases are entirely different said mrs bryce i am a widow and mr golding is my late husband's executor it is necessary he should come here on business said ida with considerable meaning underlying the words do you mean to hint that mr golding does not come on business said mrs bryce angrily oh dear no said ida but some men have such a happy way of combining business and pleasure mrs bryce commenced to feel uncomfortable those calm steady eyes of her stepdaughter seemed to search her through and through and to probe to the uttermost her shallow nature she controlled her temper and said and pray when do you propose to go in this wild excursion to munda i am writing to ted at once if you have no objection to offer to our going said ida it would be no use my offering objections said mrs bryce you always disregard my advice if your brother thinks it a proper thing for you to do i raise no objection then it is settled said ida perhaps you will mention the matter to mr golding he may wish me to take a message to my brother mrs bryce felt there was some hidden meaning in ida's words she would have given much to know her stepdaughter's opinion of herbert golding she hardly understood herbert golding herself but she was fascinated by him and did not discourage his evident attentions to herself a shallow woman like mrs bryce was amenable to flattery and no one knew how to take advantage of this better than herbert golding flora we are to go to munda if they will have us said ida joyfully have you spoken to mrs bryce already about it said flora in surprise yes i thought it better to get it over she called me in to say that mr golding was invited to dinner so i retaliated by saying we were about to storm munda was she very shocked said flora very said ida to all outward appearances inwardly she was delighted to be rid of us now i will go and inform ted of our plans we shall look ridiculous if he refuses to have us he will not refuse said flora he will be so glad to have you there and some one else too i expect sly boots said ida with a merry laugh come to my room while i write the letter flora perhaps you would like to add a postscript on your own account ida you are ridiculous said flora i will write to wyndham while you write to your brother two such missives cannot fail to have the desired result replied ida End of chapter six chapter seven of who done it by nat gould this librivox recording is in the public domain two men from my sister said ted bryce as he opened the letter-bag which had just arrived at munda and looked at the envelope he held in his hand from my sister said wyndham hanworth as he took the letter handed to him chorus 
What, what can, can they, they have, have to, to write, write about? about? The two men sat down and read their letters. Well, said Ted, looking up with a smile. Well, echoed Wyndham, returning the smile. I expect your letter closely resembles mine, said Ted. Probably, said Wyndham. I am surprised at Flora. Of course, it's quite impossible. What's impossible? asked Ted Bryce. That Flora should come to Munda with your sister. Nonsense, said Ted Bryce. I shall send a wire telling them to pack up and come at once. We shall be busy with shearing, but the girls will enjoy the scene. I do not think Flora ought to come, said Wyndham. It does not look well, Ted. Hang the looks. Let us consult Mrs. O'Brien, said Ted. Mrs. O'Brien answered to the summons. She was a stout, strongly built woman, with a coarse, homely, honest face, and looked quite capable not only of taking care of herself, but of a whole family. "'I'll give her a start,' whispered Ted Bryce to the artist. "'Mrs. O'Brien,' said Ted solemnly, "'Miss Ida and Miss Flora Hanworth will be here on the day after tomorrow.' Mrs. O'Brien held up both hands, gave a gasp, and dropped into a cane chair that creaked under her weight. "'Bless us, Master Edward,' she said. "'You're joking.' Mrs. O'Brien had made rigorous attempts to refrain from calling him Master Edward, but all had turned out failures. Edward Bryce did not object to it. He knew what an honest old soul Mrs. O'Brien was. "'I'm not joking,' said Ted Bryce. "'Here is Miss Ida's letter. She says she's coming and bringing Miss Hanworth with her. I think you know, when my sister states her intention of doing a certain thing, she generally carries it out.' "'Sure she does.' said Mrs. O'Brien. But it's dreadful, it really is. What shall I do with them, and the shearing coming on? Can you manage to look after them? said Ted Bryce. If we must, I must, said Mrs. O'Brien. If Miss Ida says she's coming, she'll come, and nobody will stop her. Bless her dear heart, she always was so wilful. Worse than me? asked Ted. Lawks, yes, said Mrs. O'Brien. You was bad enough, Master Edward. "'But Miss Ida was a whole regiment in comparison.' "'Wyndham Hanworth laughed heartily. "'You have seen my sister, Mrs. O'Brien?' he asked. "'Yes, sir, and she's a sweet, pretty young lady. "'I expect I'll be able to manage her better than Miss Ida. "'Oh, deary me, what a time I shall have,' said Mrs. O'Brien. "'Then I will tell my sister you will have all prepared for them,' said Ted Bryce. "'I'll do my best, Master Edward.' replied Mrs. O'Brien. There's plenty of room for him at Munda, that's one comfort. I hope them shearers will keep quiet. If it come to war, they might frighten the ladies. I do not think it would quite come to war, said Ted, laughing. If, however, it does come to war, you must act as their bodyguard. Guard em with me body, is it? said Mrs. O'Brien. I'd like to see the son of em that'd lay a finger on my young lady and she flourished a brawny arm fiercely. "'You see, Wynne,' said Ted, smiling, "'our sisters will be perfectly safe in Mrs. O'Brien's care.' "'In that case I waive my objection,' said Wyndham. "'Let them come by all means. "'I'm sure Flora will enjoy it immensely.' So it was decided to send a telegram, asking the girls to come at once, and Ted and Wyndham would meet them at Louth. "'I told you so,' said Ida to Flora, when she received the wire. We are to go at once. Mrs. Bryce was duly informed of their decision, and feebly protesting, she allowed them to depart. She had informed Mr. Golding of the approaching departure of the girls, and he had been secretly elated at the prospect of seeing Mrs. Bryce alone more frequently. It was a dusty, hot journey to Burke, but the two girls did not mind it in the least. To Flora, everything was strange. She had never been so far up country before, and the sights were new to her. The coach ride from Burke was not agreeable. Ida thought, Ida thought she had never been so bumped about before, and Flora was in constant dread of the coach capsizing. At Louth they were heartily greeted by their brothers, and the drive to Munda was one of enjoyment. At Munda, Mrs. O'Brien almost wept for joy at seeing Miss Ida again, 
and flora thought they could not come to much harm with such a good motherly soul to look after them they were quickly at home at munda and flora thought it a delightful place how quiet and tranquil it all seemed after the bustle of the city she was not surprised that edward bryce preferred to live at munda she liked him all the better for it he was so different from these town men so much more manly and self-reliant and edward bryce felt there was a new interest in his life now flora hanworth had come to munda the homestead seemed to have undergone a sudden transformation since the two girls arrived their presence brightened everything and wyndham hanworth thought he had never seen ida bryce look so well as she did free and unfettered at munda mrs o'brien was here there and everywhere looking after the comfort of the girls the men could shift for themselves now it was her young lady she had to consider the girls retired early the night of their arrival and as it was moonlight and almost as light as day ted bryce and his companion went for a stroll in the cooler air of the evening thousands upon thousands of sheep had been brought in ready for shearing and they could be seen lying thick almost like snow upon the ground shall you have a big tally this year asked wyndham i think so replied ted i expect to shear about a hundred and thirty thousand what an enormous lot said wyndham it seems so to you said ted but there are larger stations than mine out west i've known sixty thousand sheep and lambs die in a drought it is simply terrible to see the tracks covered with bleached bones what a careless sort of life these shearers lead said wyndham free and easy replied ted they knock up a good cheque and then go to the nearest town and knock it down the bulk of their money i'm afraid goes to the publicans come over to the camp i see the lights are in yet you will see some rough customers the shearers camp was pitched near the main track which ran through munda station and was not far from the darling river there must have been a couple of hundred men there and as edward bryce said some of them were rough customers as they neared the camp several men stared at them and presently one man evidently superior to the others came forward good evening mr bryce he said glad to see you i was wishing to speak to you anything important dow asked ted turning to wyndham hanworth he said this is tom dow he's one of the unionist leaders but i'm glad to say he's more moderate than some of them glad to hear it said wyndham a little moderation never comes amiss you're right there said tom dow but there ought to be moderation on both sides i wanted to ask you mr bryce if you had fully made up your mind not to sign the agreement i mean to act as my father acted said ted bryce i will pay union wages but i will not be tied down by any hard and fast agreement i'm sorry you will not shear under union rules said tom dow if you agree to the rate of pay i fail to see what objection you can have to abiding by the rules my objection is this said ted i think i have a perfect right to employ non-union men if i think proper there are men who were here last shearing and i'm not going to send them away when they stood by my father and got him out of a difficulty then i'm afraid there will be trouble mr bryce said dow we have a determined lot of men in camp here and i will make yours a test shed that of course remains with them said ted i claim the right to do as i feel disposed in this matter they can do the same all i can say is i'm sorry said tom dow you stuck up for the men when it was hinted they had a hand in your father's death and you were right i'm certain none of our men would do such a deed if we did not agree with your father we respected him was it not stated during the election that there would be no disturbance at munda this shearing asked william hanworth i believe so replied tom dow but you must remember the men who made that promise were not as a rule shearers they merely expressed their opinion as to what the shearers would do i believe if it rested with you dow there would be very little trouble here and i'm sorry that it does not said ted bryce i hope however the men will agree to shear without endeavouring to force me to sign any agreement one thing you may tell them dow and that is i shall not give way 
I'll do my best to bring about a settlement, said Tom Dow, but my instructions are positive, and I must not disobey orders. What is the general feeling among the men? asked Ted. The bulk of them would agree to work at union rates without any signing, I think, said Tom Dow. There are, however, several men in camp who rule the others. These men will stick out for the employment of unionists only. Has there been any mention of my father's death in the camp? asked Ted Bryce. Yes, replied Dow. It is often mentioned, but I have heard no opinion given as to how it happened, or the reason for the outrage. It is a strange thing to me no clue has been discovered. You knew my father, said Ted. Have you formed any idea on the subject? Nothing definite, said Dow. At first I thought it was an attempt at robbery, but such turned out not to be the case. I shall never rest until the man who committed the deed is brought to justice, said Ted Bryce. I don't believe there's a man in this camp that would not rejoice to see the murder of your father caught, said Dow. Do what you can to bring about a peaceable arrangement, said Ted Bryce to Dow, as they turned to walk back to the homestead. That man has a good face, said Wyndham Hanworth. Is he a leader amongst these men? Partly so, said Ted, and he is secretary for the district. He has more than one camp to look after. You'll be able to get a few sketches tomorrow, for the men are coming up to the shed to see what arrangements I'm going to make. Will there be a row? asked the artist. Not tomorrow. That will come later, replied Ted. At this moment, a thoroughbred youngster galloped past them. There goes a younger that'll make a flyer before long, said Ted. He's by Phantom. Oh, by the by, you've not heard about the Phantom horse. I must try and let you have a peep at him. He's been running loose here for some years. No one can catch him. He's a wonder and a beauty to look at. The Phantom horse, said Wyndham. Is he a wild horse? A blood stallion, said Ted. He has a history which you shall hear some day. That two-year-old is by him. That's why I said he was by Phantom. I did not know you went in for race horses, said Wyndham. We have some well-bred ones on the station, said Ted. But I've never raced much, except at Burke, Forbes, Bathurst and country meetings. If that young Phantom is good enough, I shall send him to a Randwick trainer to see what he can do with him. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of Who Did It by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Old Wide Awake. The night Edward Bryce and his friend Wyndham Hanworth visited the Shearers' camp, Old Wide Awake was there. Wide Awake was well known to most of the men, and as he had had nothing to do with the shearing, the Unionists admitted him to their camp and he enlivened the night for them by playing the accordion or telling some story of adventure. Such men as Wide Awake, known only by their nicknames, are often found in the camps, and no one tries to find out who they really are. Wide Awake was bent on discovering if any of these men knew what had led to the murder of Mr. Bryce. He had a difficult task before him, because if his purpose were suspected, and they became aware he had a suspicion of some of their number, he would be in considerable danger. Wide Awake was, however, used to dangers of many kinds. His life had been risked too often for him to value it highly. He had seen Edward Bryce and Wyndham Hanworth visit the camp, and observed them in conversation with Tom Dow, but they had not seen him. "'Well, Mr. Dow,' said Wide Awake, what chance is there of this affair ending peaceably? Not much, I'm afraid, was the reply. Mr. Bryce is obstinate. Once he makes up his mind, he takes a deal of shifting, said Wide Awake. But he's just a man all the same. Come, Widey, give us a tune, said one of the men. All right, replied Wide Awake, and commenced a popular music hall ditty, and the chorus was quickly taken up. The shearers were spread about in groups. The bulk of them were clad in moleskin pants and merino singlets, and were quite warm enough without more clothes on. They were a strange-looking lot of men, and some of them had villainous faces, 
while others showed traces of better days wide awake having played several tunes put down his accordion and commenced to chat sporting topics were the chief subject of conversation the betting on the next big event was discussed and the chances of the horses summed up according to individual ideas of their merits some chance remark gave wide awake the opportunity he desired and he said what a mysterious affair that murder of henry bryce was you think it was murder said one of the men not much doubt about it said wide awake when a man is poleaxed on the head and his body is found in the water there's not much difficulty in arriving at a conclusion as to how he came by his death i don't believe he was murdered said the man i mean intentionally perhaps he got into a row and a blow he received was aimed at someone else a likely yarn that said wide awake it's as good a yarn as yours anyway said the man who was a bully and not liked in the camp that's a matter of opinion said wide awake quarrels soon arise in these mixed communities and the men are never loath to witness a fight the man who was talking to wide awake was a big hulking fellow named eli spence a bully but a coward at heart his size made most of the men fight shy of him but they would have given a trifle to see him taken down in a stand-up fight eli spence was always ready to bandy words with any man and he regarded wide awake as fair game to insult or merely poke fun at as occasion might arise well your opinion ain't worth much said eli spence i was at that election meeting when henry bryce spoke it's my belief that henry bryce was not sober and when a man's had drink it's easy enough for him to run his head against a post or to fall into the water wide awake looked closely at eli spence when he said he was at mr bryce's election meeting what are you staring at said eli insolently perhaps you don't think i was at the meeting call me a liar at once i never said you were not there said wide awake you gave me the information yourself i did not ask you for it then what are you staring at me for said eli i fancied i'd seen you before said wide awake oh indeed and where did you see me mr no name said eli spence i had dropped that eli sang out a man in the group a man can go under any name he likes here it's no business of ours came from several quarters i saw you i believe in san francisco said wide awake eli spence gave a slight start then he swore and said he had never been to frisco in his life he'd never been out of australia and didn't want to go then i'm mistaken said wide awake as to my having no name i prefer wide awake to that of eli spence ex-policeman what's that widey shouted several men is eli an ex-policeman ask him said wide awake it's a lie roared eli spence i'll make you prove it i can soon prove it said wide awake ten years ago you were in the police force of san francisco i could not call to mind at first who you were i do now i recollect you being dismissed from the force what for what did he do asked several men glad to see bully spence finding his level and yet dreading the consequences to wide awake who was a general favourite let him tell you himself i will not said wide awake i only wanted to prove that my name is better than his own or at all events as good eli spence was in a towering rage the accusation levelled against him was true and he meant to take it out of wide awake i tell you what he says is false said eli spence if he knows what i was dismissed the force for let him out with it there you were in the force eli and you were dismissed said a man you have let the cat out of the bag said another out up eli shouted a third out with it we are dismissed because you had too many gold watches at your diggings a roar of laughter greeted the speaker's remark and eli spence turning on wide awake said i'll make you suffer for this i'll be even with you the sooner the better said wide awake bah you're an old man said eli contemptuously i wouldn't hurt you for the world you'll find i'm not so old as i look if you come any of your frisco tricks on me said wide awake 
"'Fair play, fair play!' shouted the men, rushing in between Eli and Wide Awake, as the former made a forward movement and raised his clenched hand threateningly. "'Stand back!' roared Eli. "'Let me thrash the old fool. He's been blackguarding me long enough.' "'What did Eli do in Frisco?' said one of the shearers. "'Let's have it out!' shouted several men. "'Eli Spence was in the Frisco force,' said Wide Awake, "'but he was one of a gang of organised robbers. "'Many a man have they hit on the head and then flung into the harbour. As Wide Awake said these words, a sudden thought seemed to strike him, and for a moment he turned pale. He recollected the band, of which Eli Spence was one, were called High Flyers, and that their method of disposing of their victims was similar to the manner in which Henry Bryce had met his death. It must only be a coincidence. Eli Spence could have no possible motive for murdering Henry Bryce. It's a pack of lies, roared Eli. I never hit a man on the head in my life except in a fair fight. If you must know why I was dismissed the force, alone I was in it, it was for kissing a lass who objected to my doing so. Loud laughter followed this statement. "'She couldn't stand you, Eli,' said one. "'That's a bit thin,' said another. "'It won't wash, Eli,' and sundry other remarks were showered upon him. Seizing his opportunity, Eli Spence aimed a terrific blow at Wide Awake, who now stood opposite to him. The bully was maddened with the taunts hurled at him, and could not control his feelings. Wide Awake sprang quickly to one side, and Eli Spence, overreaching himself, fell to the ground, amidst another roar of laughter. "'The old man's a bit too nimble for you. Have another shot at him, Eli!' Eli Spence scrambled to his feet, bellowing with rage. Wide Awake was ready for him. As he had stated, he was a much younger man than he looked. Sorrow and care had made him appear aged before his time. He knew Eli Spence was a formidable antagonist, but Wide Awake had been accustomed to fight his own battles for many years. The passion Eli was in would place him at a disadvantage with a man as cool as Wide Awake. The shearers saw it meant a fight, and they were determined to see fair play, and, if necessary, protect Wide Awake from serious harm. "'Come on, you cur!' shouted Eli Spence. "'I'll soon knock your head out of shape for you!' Wide Awake, in his early days, had been taught that once a quarrel was inevitable, there was a lot in getting the first blow in. Before Eli Spence had well got the words out of his mouth, Wide Awake's right fist shot out and caught the bully between the eyes, and then, as Eli Spence staggered back, dazed and astonished beyond measure, Wide Awake came round with his left and knocked him down with a well-directed blow on the jaw. In an instant, the shed was a wild scene of excitement. The shearer shouted and yelled and roared with delight. "'Bravo, old un! Go it, Widey! Get up, Eli! Are you dead, man? Perhaps he's had enough!' Such were the cries heard on all sides. Eli Spence staggered to his feet. He was blind and furious with rage. If he had had his knife in his belt, he would have made short work of Wide Awake. He rushed forward, and by the sheer force of his impetuosity, he got a blow home on Wide Awake's left eye, which at once commenced to swell. The blow seemed to turn Wide Awake into a different man. He avoided Eli as much as possible, and dodged his blows. This was wise policy, as Eli Spence soon became tired and lost his wind. When Wide Awake saw him falter, he changed his tactics, he went in at close quarters, and in a few minutes he had Eli Spence completely beaten and at his mercy. He bided his time and played with him before he gave him the final knock-down blow. Eli Spence made one desperate effort to rally, but finding it of no avail, he gave a furious kick at Wide Awake below the belt. This cowardly action caused an angry shout from the men. Wide Awake, however, thought it was now time to end the battle, so he gave Eli a terrific blow on the temple, and the big man fell down insensible, and lay like a log on the floor. 
cheer after cheer greeted wide awake's victory and he took it very quietly that will keep him quiet for a few days said wide awake if he wants a return battle when he comes round you can tell him i'm willing good night lads i'll go back home now and he picked up his accordion and walked quickly away to escape further congratulations wide awake knew he had made a bitter enemy in eli spence but he cared very little about that he could not get the idea out of his head that eli spence was in some way connected with the attack on henry bryce he knew spence had been a desperate man in frisco and had not stopped at murder so it was hinted there at the time of his dismissal from the force he meant to watch eli spence and see if he could glean some information that would either set at rest or confirm his doubts next morning edward bryce saw wide awake had a swollen eye and was cut about the face he inquired the cause and wide awake related all that had occurred the night before but kept his ideas about eli spence to himself i'm sorry this occurred said ted it may make the men more difficult to deal with spence was a bully and unpopular said wide awake i think you'll find his defeat will assist you rather than go the other way such proved to be the case end of chapter eight chapter nine of who did it by nat gould this librivox recording is in the public domain the phantom horse a deputation from the union shearers waited upon edward bryce and headed by tom dow as spokesman endeavoured to induce him to sign the agreement and thus make munda a union shed edward bryce declined to retreat from the position he had taken up and intimated he should start with non-union men if the others decided not to accept his terms tom dow tried to quiet the men but angry threats were uttered as they moved away and edward bryce was convinced there would be trouble he was almost sorry his sister and flora had come to munda there was no telling what these men might do or into what excesses they would be led there was nothing for it but to abide the result riots had occurred on one or two stations and the government had offered to send police to munda to enforce order and protect property meanwhile they were a merry household at munda and mrs o'brien protested that miss ida had turned the homestead upside down you said you would tell me about the phantom horse said wyndham hanworth to ted as they were all seated on the veranda one night after dinner perhaps it would not interest the ladies said ted i should very much like to hear about a phantom horse said flora and ida said she had almost forgotten the story so it would be interesting to hear it again it would be a good subject for a picture said ida to wyndham the title is catching replied the artist when i hear the story i shall be able to form a better idea as to whether it will make up into a good picture there are several versions of the phantom horse story said edward bryce but i think the one i shall tell you is true nine or ten years ago said ted one of our boundary riders came in with an extraordinary story he had been out as usual and returned home rather late he was tired and so was his horse and they were making slow progress towards his hut suddenly the man fancied he heard a sound like horses galloping at a furious pace he listened intently and became certain the rumble was caused by horses he looked round but could see nothing it was open country where he was but a couple of miles beyond him it was well wooded and the ground became more broken and hilly he was at a loss to know where the horses had come from for the bulk of the mares were fourteen or fifteen miles away you must know said ted that a horse of this description will entice mares away and gallop off with them to his lair wherever it may be this goes to show the wonderful power the male has over the female he added with a glance at his sister indeed said ida this is the first i've heard of it at all events the phantom horse has exercised wonderful power over mares on munda station during the past ten years the boundary rider was not long before he saw galloping in his direction 
half a dozen horses in front he saw a fine powerful grey horse and he knew he had never seen him before he rubbed his eyes fancying he must have been deceived but no there plain enough was the horse and he looked almost white as they drew nearer to him the leader caught sight of the boundary rider and at once changed his course and the man then saw there were five blood mares belonging to munda after him he knew in the tired condition his horse was in it was hopeless to give chase and he determined to ride on to his hut and then early in the morning to take another man with him and go in search of the horse and mares next morning he related to old wide awake what he had seen has wide awake been here ten years said ida off and on he has said ted he went away for a couple of years but came back again at all events he was here at the time i speak of for he accompanied the boundary rider whose name i forget in his search after the white horse wide awake has told me more than once the story of that ride i remember when a lad how excited i got over his recital he can tell the story much better than i can but i'm afraid he is not in a fit state to appear before ladies this evening so you must accept me in his place what is the matter with him asked ida i hope he's not met with an accident nothing serious said ted with a wink at wyndham he ran against some obstruction last night and hurt his eye but to my story wide awake and his mates were mounted on two of the fastest horses at munda and they had no fear of not being able to head the runaways provided they came across them they followed for several miles in the direction the horses had gone the previous night and soon found traces of them as the ground was moist wide awake however discovered they were on the wrong track for the horses had doubled and gone back again they rolled back and found marks on the right which had been newly made they were now in a country but little known to the station hands and boundary riders as they rode on the growth became more dense but there seemed to be a regular track made by horses constantly passing along wide awake was in front when all at once an extraordinary sight was before him looking down at the track formed between the growth of stunted trees and wild tangle of underwood he saw an open space green and cool evidently a choice plot of pasture in the midst of all this forest standing under the shade of a large tree was a fine grey blood horse and around him were five mares wide awake recognised as belonging to the station the grey horse he had never seen before where had such a splendid animal sprung from for wide awake could see at a glance he was a prince among stallions the two men halted and looked at the group under the tree and various were their surmises as to where the grey had come from the wind was blowing slightly in the direction of the horses and presently wide awake saw the grey lift his head sniff the air and then commence to paw the ground the horse had scented danger and from his movements it was evident that he was accustomed to it and knew how to act he neighed loudly and this at once secured a response from the horses hidden in the bush no sooner did the grey hear the answering neigh than he snorted defiance made a snap at the mares then headed them and led the way at a smart gallop from this the men concluded there was an outlet at the other side of the open space without further delay they pressed forward and were soon in the open ground at the far end to their left they saw the last of the mares disappearing they at once gave chase it was a wild ride it is well known that horses ridden by good men can generally head a horse with no burden on his back it may seem strange but it is true i have seen a horse get rid of his rider over hurdles and go on leading the field for perhaps half a mile but at the end of the journey he came in last across the open they galloped and passing again through a narrow opening came out into clear country in a very short time in front about half a mile ahead were the horses the grey still leading they imagined it would be an easy matter to overtake them after an hour or so hard galloping they were vastly mistaken the grey horse led them a merry dance mile after mile passed and still the horses were well ahead at last a couple of the mares commenced to flag the grey noticed their signs of distress 
but dare not slacken his pace. One black mare galloped alongside him, and Wide Awake noticed the horse seemed to encourage her and urge her on. Two mares fell back beaten, and the men passed them. Another mile and a third dropped out, and then a fourth, but the black mare still continued to gallop with the horse. On they went, and Wide Awake says he never had such an exciting chase before or since. Nearer and nearer they drew to the galloping pair. They were almost on to them, when the grey horse, as though realising the mare could go no faster, suddenly shot forward and left her behind. The speed at which the grey went after all these miles, Wide Awake says, was astonishing. They raced after him, but soon found it was all to no purpose. Instead of gaining upon the grey, he was leaving them, and they could feel their horses had gone far enough. At last they were compelled to halt, and no sooner had they done so than the grey slackened his pace, and finally stopping, wheeled round and looked at them, shaking his head in defiance. It was no use following him then, so they turned their horses round and went back after the mares. They found them all thoroughly knocked up, and had not much difficulty in driving them home to the nearest paddock. Both Wide Awake and his mate were tired out, and the former slept in the boundary rider's hut. Next morning, Wide Awake came on to Munda and told his story. Scores of times since then, the phantom horse, as we call him, has led the best horses and riders in the country many a long stern chase. In ten years, no one has ever been able to capture him or even head him, and it is impossible to corner him. Where the horse came from is a mystery and will remain so. It is said, however, that he is an imported stallion that was stolen from one of the stations, and it is supposed he got away from the thieves, galloped into the dense country, and was never caught again. How he came to Munda district I do not know. Certain it is he was not seen here until ten years ago. He is now almost white, and must be fifteen or sixteen years old, but he can still gallop like the wind. On a moonlight night he can sometimes be seen near the paddocks, and being white he has a strange weird look about him that has caused the men to christen him the phantom horse. He is very particular in his choice, and always selects the best mares to run off with. That youngster I pointed out to you last night is a young phantom. All his stock can gallop, and we conclude from this he must be very well bred. He will never be caught, of that I am certain. We could shoot him, of course, but his stock turn out so well we do not mind him running away with some of our best mares occasionally. Oh, Ted, do let us have a gallop after him, said Ida, who was a very good horsewoman. Would you like it, Flora? I know you can ride. What, give chase to a phantom? said Wyndham. Yes, said Ida, it will be glorious. Do let us try and get a peep at him. I've never seen him. It is rather risky work said Ted Bryce, but if Wynne and Flora think they can manage the ride, I shall be only too pleased for you all to have a gallop. Mind, it will be a genuine gallop, for the Phantom seems to magnetise the horses chasing him and draw them on. We can take Wide Awake with us, and young Law, who's a first-rate lad on a horse. Can Wide Awake ride well enough now? said Ida. Is he not too old? If you knew what Wide Awake can do, you would be astonished, said her brother. He is a wiry, middle-aged, active man, and ten years younger than he looks, I should say. Wyndham Hanworth and his sister were both good in the saddle. It was their one extravagance, so the artist said. He was a thorough believer in horse exercise, and argued that in the end it was more economical and much pleasanter than paying a doctor. Then we'll go tomorrow, said Ted Bryce. Wide awake can see as much with one eye as most people can with two, so his damaged optic need not stand in the way. I will give orders to have the horses ready, as we must make an early start. We have to find the phantom before we can chase him. End of chapter 9「Chapter 10 of Who Did It?" by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Rattling Gallop Wide Awake selected the best horses at Munda for the ride after the Phantom, as he knew they would be required. They were all well-bred, 
and the pair on which Ida and Flora were mounted were sired by the horse they were about to seek. "'What a beauty!' said Ida, as she stroked the arched neck of the bay on which she was seated. "'He does not much resemble his sire in colour. "'No,' said her brother, "'but he has inherited his galloping powers, and it takes a good one to beat him.' Flora's mount was a wiry, well-set horse, but had not the spirit of Ida's bay. Ted Bryce knew what a good rider his sister was, but he thought Flora could hardly manage such a spirited animal. His own horse was the one he generally rode at Munda, a thoroughbred and fast enough for any run. Wyndham Hanworth was well pleased with his mount, and before the chase that followed was over, he had good reason to be thankful his horse was a clinker. Wide Awake and young Hiram Law went with them, and they all rode out of the homestead enclosure in high spirits. The day was not too hot, although the sun was shining brilliantly. Wide Awake led the way, and he said he thought he knew in which direction the phantom could be found, as three of the mares were out with him. A smart gallop across a level, even paddock put the party on good terms with themselves. "'This is splendid,' said Flora, who was riding alongside Edward Bryce, Ida being ahead with Wyndham Hanworth. "'Nothing like a smart gallop for invigorating one,' said Ted. "'It has brought the colour into your cheeks. You are looking much better than when you arrived at Manda. The change will do you a lot of good.' "'It was very kind of you to let us come to Manda," she replied. "'I hardly knew what to say when Ida broached the subject. I thought Mrs. Bryce would object.' which no doubt she did said ted i dare say she thought it a terrible thing for two young ladies to pay a visit to two bachelors at munda were you glad to come he asked earnestly oh yes said flora frankly then checking herself added you know i never care to be separated from my brother for very long i flatter myself i am useful to him and that he misses me i'm sure he does said ted i know he was very pleased to hear you were coming he seems to get on very well with ida look at them now how earnestly they are talking he admires ida very much said flora she is a lovable girl and so high-spirited she puts me in the shade utterly that i am sure she does not said ted looking at her admiringly flora hanworth was charming in her habit and with a small hard hat sitting jauntily on her well-shaped head ted bryce thought he had never seen her look so well there was not much time for conversation as wide awake hinted they must push forward after a ten miles ride they commenced to leave the level plains and to enter the broken country keeping a keen lookout wide awake soon saw traces of the horses they were in search of he requested wyndham hanworth and ida to bear to the left with hiram law as guide while he went on with Edward Bryce and Flora. "'We can meet at a certain point I've arranged with Law,' he said, "'and then once in front of the Phantom, "'he will probably make for the open, "'and we shall have a rattling gallop after him.' This was considered the best plan, and the party separated to meet, as Wide Awake had appointed. In about an hour they came together again, and Wide Awake, pointing ahead, said, "'There's the Phantom, and the mares are with him.' They looked in the direction indicated, and there, sure enough, about a mile away, was the grey horse and three mares, quietly cropping the grass, unaware danger was at hand. "'The best thing we can do is gallop straight for them,' said Wide Awake, "'and they will then make for the open.' They set their horses in motion, and quickly broke into a gallop. When about half-way across the open, the phantom saw them, and as though realising there was no time to be lost, he turned quickly and galloped away with the mares. "'Bravo!' shouted Ted. "'He's making straight for the plain. We shall have a grand gallop after him. This beats fox-hunting, I guess. Come along, girls. Now then, win. Let us see what our horses are made of.' Away they went, with Wide Awake and Hiram Law leading. The ground was rough, but the bush-bred horses thought nothing of it, and Flora considered it marvellous how they avoided the numerous holes and rocks that lay almost directly in their track. "'We're in for a jump,' said Ted, as he saw Wide Awake and Law set their horses at a huge fallen tree that lay right across their track. 
all right shouted wyndham we'll take it together flora shouted ida follow the leaders it was not a formidable jump but it was the first that day and consequently increased the excitement of the gallop they all got safely over and ida's bay gave a tremendous leap but she sat firm as a rock and did not move in her saddle in front they could see the phantom leading the mares and flora thought of edward bryce's story the previous night and how much it resembled the reality dashing through the bushwood they were not long in reaching level open ground and then the chase commenced in earnest the phantom horse seemed to know he would have to do his best and the mares as usual soon found it impossible to keep pace with him they fell back and were soon passed by the riders who took but little notice of them so intent were they on the white spot dancing in front of them and gradually drawing ahead we shall never catch him said ida what a galloper he is this is something like a run the draghounds are very tame after this it is the first time i have ever hunted a wild horse said wyndham i confess i relish the sensation he's gaining on us wide awake shouted ted bryce push on or he'll lose us we cannot go much faster replied wide awake i can said ted excitedly and shouted to those behind him come along follow me we'll try and head him be careful ladies sang out young law as they dashed past him the ground is tricky farther on we'll be careful said ida follow us this was quite sufficient for hiram law he was a light weight and his horse hardly felt his burden i'm off wide awake he shouted miss ida told me to follow her keep your eyes on em sang out wide awake who was now in the rear ted bryce and wyndham were racing neck and neck and ida and flora were close behind their blood was up and the excitement of the riders acted on their horses it was a glorious gallop there was no time to speak very little time to think ted bryce urged his horse on and almost forgot the others were behind him the phantom horse could now be plainly seen the gap between him and the riders had lessened his splendid action and great stride excited ted's admiration i'll head you yet he thought it will be something worth talking about if i can beat the phantom in a race he looked back and saw the others were not far behind on they went and mile after mile was left behind and still the phantom held out no signs of distress the thunder of the horse's hoofs resounded on the hard ground but it was not long before they were in a country where the earth was loose and resembled a rabbit warren full of holes and pitfalls ted's horse stumbled once or twice but after finding out the nature of the ground he picked his way in a very clever manner the phantom galloped on and ted saw with delight they were gaining on him the horse was evidently out of his usual country and did not know the ground well in a few minutes there was a cloud of dust ahead a white horse struggling on the ground and ted knew the phantom had fallen come along he shouted excitedly he's down we'll catch him now ida bryce urged her horse forward and flora followed her closely hiram law was galloping alongside wyndham hanworth mr bryce will be down if he don't be careful said the lad i know this ground is nasty i've never heard of the phantom coming down before if he falls there's not much chance for us hiram had hardly got the words out of his mouth when his horse came down with a bang on to his nose and the lad shot over his head turning a complete somersault and landing on his back ida laughed merrily as she saw him scramble to his feet the phantom horse was on his feet again and galloped on none the worse for his fall ted bryce and wyndham had gained on him considerably and their hopes of heading him were high another mile and ted bryce was within a dozen yards of the hitherto unbeaten grey the phantom horse snorted savagely but galloped on nearer and nearer ted bryce drew to him and his nerves tingled with excitement now his horse was almost level with the phantom and ida called out ted's got him flora look look he's nearly level the phantom's beaten at last but if beaten 
the phantom did not mean to be trapped without any warning the grey horse suddenly swerved round to the left and rushed right across the track of edward bryce's horse the move was so sudden that ted bryce had no time to check his mount his horse startled at this change of tactics got out of his stride crossed his forelegs and came down heavily ted bryce was unhurt he scrambled to his feet still holding his horse's bridle and then looked round for the phantom the grey horse checked in his course by the other riders for a moment stood at bay it was at this instant ted bryce got on his feet then he saw the phantom make a savage rush at flora hanworth who sat on her horse a little to the right of the others ted bryce gave a loud cry of alarm flora hanworth saw the savage animal rushing on to her and was too confused to attempt to move her horse in another moment flora and her horse were knocked over by the phantom and the grey was lashing out furiously at them with his heels my god she'll be killed shouted ted bryce dropping the reins of his horse and rushing to the spot flora was rendered insensible by the fall but was luckily thrown out of the saddle hiram law and wyndham were there before him and the phantom seeing them galloped off at a furious pace wide awake coming up at the time caught ted bryce's horse and led him up to the spot ted bryce rushed to flora and dragged her out of harm's way he knelt down and raising her supported her body her head drooped and he saw she was insensible she's fainted win he said i hope to god she's not injured i shall never forgive myself if she's come to any harm wyndham hanworth and ida bryce had dismounted and now stood about the prostrate girl she's stunned with the fall said wide awake flora was not long before she opened her eyes and saw edward bryce bending over her the look in his eyes startled her and the colour came into her cheeks he bent over her and said softly are you much hurt flora tell me you're not injured he called her flora and she felt a delicious sense of happiness steal over her i am all right she said quietly i was stunned by the fall my head pains me but that is all luckily flora hanworth had received no severe injuries she was bruised and shaken but managed to ride to munda although the journey was tedious edward bryce was heartily glad when they reached the homestead and flora was at once put in charge of mrs o'brien who ordered her to bed and attended on her as well as a mother and doctor combined would have done she'll be all right in the morning master edward said mrs o'brien in answer to his anxious inquiry thank heaven for that he said mrs o'brien looked after him and shook her head it comes to em all sooner or later she said to herself well she's a bonny girl and i'm sure she loves him i can see it in her eyes when i mention his name End of chapter ten chapter eleven of who did it by nat gould this librivox recording is in the public domain trouble brewing flora hanworth quickly recovered from the shock caused by her fall the next day she was up for dinner and although pale said she felt no ill effects you had a narrow escape said ted the phantom was desperate i was afraid he would kick you it was an anxious moment for me flora was i indeed in danger she asked yes replied ted if you'd been seriously injured i don't know what i should have done it was evident both to ida bryce and wyndham hanworth that this incident had drawn flora and edward bryce closer together ida was pleased she would gladly welcome flora as a sister our first batch of non-union shearers arrived from sydney to-day said ted to wyndham i expect the union men will induce them to join their camp at any rate the bulk of them that will be hard lines said wyndham when you've gone to the expense of bringing them up that counts for nothing said ted if persuasion has no effect the union men will resort to force it will not be the first time they've done so here it was as edward bryce anticipated twenty or thirty men who had undertaken to shear at munda 
and had been forwarded from Sydney, when they reached the station, were induced to join the Union camp. The other ten declined, and in consequence came in for torrents of abuse, and were lucky to get off with that. Wide Awake heard the next lot of men were to be taken by force into the Union camp if they would not go voluntarily. Fifteen police had been sent to Munda to keep order. Edward Bryce would have preferred to do without them if possible, but he knew it would be unsafe not to have some protection with such a large camp of men on the spot. The River Darling was still navigable, and Ted had entered into arrangements with the captain of one of the cargo boats to bring the men down during the night. As cargo boats were not allowed to travel downstream at night, he thought the Union picket men would be off their guard. The captain of the boat brought twenty men safely down, but unfortunately he misunderstood his directions and landed them at the wrong place. More than an hour was lost before the Munda men and the police came across them, and by this time it was light, and the Unionists were astir. There was no help for it but to march for the sheds as quickly as possible, and avoid an encounter with the Union men. All went well until the camp was roused. The Unionist pickets saw the men marching to Munda, and at once gave the signal to the men in the camp. The Unionists turned out in a body about a hundred strong, and most of the men had formidable-looking weapons in the shape of heavy sticks in their hands. The Munda men were surrounded by their escort of police, led by Sergeant Tyler, an old hand in the force. The Unionists were taken aback at the strong protection afforded the men, but they passed on and intercepted the line of march. Sergeant Tyler rode forward and requested them to allow the men to proceed peaceably to Munda, but he was answered by angry shouts and a great flourishing of sticks. Tom Dow came forward and asked to be allowed to confer with the men on their way to Munda. Sergeant Tyler declined to allow him to do so, but Edward Bryce, riding up, said, Let him speak to the men, Tyler. I want no man to work for me who is unwilling to do so. He then rode back to the men, before Tom Dow came up. The union leader wishes to speak to you. Sergeant Tyler refused to grant him permission until I asked that he might be allowed to do so. Listen to me, men. You have been engaged in Sydney and brought here at my expense. Your wages are fixed. They are at the same rate as those demanded by the union men. I want no man to shear for me without adequate pay. But I refuse to be bound hand and foot by any agreement these union men think fit to draw up. If I sign it this year, there is no telling what they may demand next year. Here is Tom Dow. I will do his work. If there is a man among you who wishes to join the union camp and leave me in the lurch, let him step out. I want no unwilling men in my shed. A cheer went up from the men at this manly speech, and then a shout of, We'll stand by you, Mr. Bryce, to a man. You have taken the wind out of my sails, said Tom Dow with a smile. May I speak to them? Certainly, said Ted Bryce and turning to the men he said, Dow wishes to say a few words to you. I have no fear what your answer will be. Another cheer from the men, and then Tom Dow said, Fellow workers, the union camp is formed here. We are all ready and willing to commence work at Manda, but for our own protection we ask Mr Bryce to sign our agreement and shear under it. He refuses to do so. We are standing up for our rights. The masters have it all their own way. We merely want justice. Will you fight against your fellow workmen? Join our camp and stand firm, and Mr Bryce will then see it's to his interest to do as we ask. We demand nothing but what is just and fair. Manda is a test shed, and our victory here would help the men who are standing up for their rights in other parts of the colony. Men, do not join the blacklegs and injure your own cause. Come out in a body and go over to the union camp. "'What do you say, men?' asked one of the newcomers, a tall, powerful man, evidently superior to the others. "'Shall we throw up Mr Bryce and join a union camp, or shall we stick to the agreement we signed in Sydney to shear at Munda?' "'We'll stick to our agreement, Ben Holt,' shouted the men. "'You've heard their answer,' said the man called Ben Holt to Tom Dow. "'I'm sorry for it,' said Dow. "'Consider well what you're doing. "'You're siding with capital against labour. "'We're doing nothing of the sort,' said Ben Holt. 
We mean to have a free hand in the choice of our work. We're not going to be ordered about by a lot of fellows like you. Bah! You're worse than the masters of long chalk. Then you decline to join us, said Tom Dow. We do, replied Ben Holt. You see those men, Sergeant Tyler, said Tom Dow, pointing to the formidable body of shearers. They are determined to stick up for their rights. I cannot control them if they wish to prevent these men working at the shed. That means you will not try to control them, replied the sergeant. Remember, Tom Dow, my men are armed. I am sent here to protect these men Mr. Bryce has engaged. If your men attempt to interfere with me in the execution of my duty, you will know what to expect. Then you mean to fire on us, said Tom Dow angrily. This is what we are taxed for, to pay men to shoot us down. A nice government we've got, and no mistake. Keep a civil tongue in your head, Tom Dow, said the sergeant, or you may get into trouble. Tom Dow went back to the unionists and told them the men had declined to join the camp. Then we'll make em join, shouted some score of angry voices. None but union men shall shear in that shed. Sergeant Tyler, with Ted Bryce and Wyndham Hanworth, moved on in front, the escort following. They look a threatening lot of men, said Tyler, but I doubt if they'll do much. I've seen a lot of them in my time, and there's not much danger in them. You see, Wyn, there will be a row after all, said Ted Bryce. Sergeant Tyler ordered his men to keep as far from the Unionists as possible, and to do nothing to provoke an encounter. He had also given strict orders that no matter what the Unionists did, the police were not to make any attack until he gave the word. They were marching past the Union men, when suddenly a shower of stones came pelting onto them. Luckily the missiles fell wide of their mark, and none of the stones did any damage. Sergeant Tyler gave no sign. He coolly rode on as if nothing had happened. The men under escort did not relish the position they were in. "'Why don't you pepper em with the guns?' shouted one man. The Unionists, seeing no notice was taken of their first attack, grew bolder and made a movement to intercept the line of march. Sergeant Tyler, with Edward Bryce and Wyndham Hanworth, rode on. In front of the men, the sergeant halted. "'I'm going to take these men to Munda, he said, quietly but firmly. "'My men have their rifles loaded. If you continue to obstruct us, I shall order them to fire. If I give an order to fire, some of you will not have a chance of shearing again under any conditions. Take my advice and return to your camp before any mischief is done.' There is a heavy punishment for rioters. Let the black legs go, said Tom Dow. We may have a chance of paying them out later on. That is a threat, Dow. I shall not forget it if any of these men are attacked during their stay at Munda, said Tyler. The Unionists did not stir, and Sergeant Tyler ordered his men to move to the left to prevent an encounter. No sooner was this done than the Union men also moved to the left and again brought them to a halt. "'I will give you one more chance,' said Tyler. "'Let my men pass on, and nothing more shall be said about it.' A sullen murmur from the mass of men was the only response. "'You will not give orders to fire on them?' asked Ted Bryce. "'No,' said the sergeant. "'I can manage this business without that.' "'Clear the way,' he shouted, but the unionists did not move. "'Force a passage,' he said to his men. Use your batons only. The police were mounted on strong, powerful horses, and at once rode forward, still surrounding the men they were escorting. The horses trampled on the feet of the foremost of the Unionists. Several men seized the bridles of the horses, but sharp blows on the hands made them relax their hold. Look out, Tyler, shouted Ted Bryce as he ducked to avoid a stone. Sergeant Tyler could not move his horse quick enough, and a sharp stone hit him on the wrist, drawing blood. He rode his horse forward, and drove the Unionists along in front of him. The police quickly forced a passage, and then from the rear came another shower of stones. Three of the shearers were knocked down, and one of the policemen fell from his horse, stunned by a blow on the head. Wyndham Hanworth felt a stinging sensation in his right knee, and looking down saw his breeches were cut and his knee bleeding. A slight scratch, said Wyndham, in answer to Ted. 
nothing more the blackguards said ted i did not think they would go so far sergeant tyler ordered six of his men to form a guard in the rear while the remainder with ted bryce and wyndham hanworth escorted the men to the homestead buildings tyler with his half dozen men charged at the crowd and laying about them freely soon dispersed them the unionists however still kept up a fire of stones as the police retired again the constable who had been knocked from his horse quickly recovered and remounted he had a nasty bump on his forehead seeing the police were determined and fancying they might use their firearms if further provoked the unionists retired to their camp they were not satisfied with what they had done and several of the worst men hinted at firing the shed and the homestead if edward bryce did not come to terms we've not done with those fellows yet said sergeant tyler to edward bryce we shall make a start to-morrow said ted and perhaps when the men see i'm determined to do without them they will cave in i hope so said tyler but i doubt it there are a lot of loafing scoundrels in the camp these men are the bane of the regular shearers the men injured in the attack were attended to and their wounds were not of a serious nature you had better not go far from the homestead ida while these men are about said ted to his sister they would not interfere with us surely said ida i do not think they attack women there's no telling what they may do in their present frame of mind said ted perhaps it would be safer to send you and flora back to sydney i'll talk the matter over with wyn do not be alarmed about us ted said ida we are not timid girls there is no occasion to pack us off to sydney End of chapter 11chapter twelve of who did it by nat gould this librivox recording is in the public domain in the shed the shearing shed was several miles from the homestead at munda lower down the river a collection of buildings was built consisting of overseer's cottage stores and various huts also a wool shed and a wool scouring plant the wool shed was a building one hundred and thirty feet long and built of colonial pine framework on piles two and a half feet from the ground the building was enclosed with galvanized corrugated iron between the sweating pen and the wool sorter's quarters was the shearer's portion of the shed which is called the board on either side of this board fifteen shearers are placed the catching pens are fixed between them into which the sheep are put from the sweating pen each pen has an opening on to the board and two shearers are supplied from each pen a passage called a race runs down the centre of the building the catching pens being on either side and a gate opens from each pen into the race the race is always kept filled with sheep from the sweating pen and as the catching pens become empty they are filled from the race machines were used in the munda shed and each shearer had two machines and a separate driving gear fitted with a brake which permitted the shearer to stop or start his machine at will briefly this was how the shed looked at munda when the roll was called sheep in large numbers could be seen on all sides in the race the catching and sweating pens all ready for an immediate start forty men answered when the roll was called and signed their names before you start said edward bryce it is hardly necessary for me to tell you we may have some more trouble with the men in camp we shall do all in our power to protect you from being molested and i expect you to help us by keeping within bounds and not go straying near the camp we have a hundred and thirty thousand sheep to shear i anticipate and i trust you will be able to get through the work as quickly as possible the men gave a cheer and at once proceeded to take their places on the board it was an animated scene and wyndham hanworth had already commenced to make sketches of the novel sights before him flora hanworth and ida bryce had ridden over from the homestead to see the start and were much interested in it the union men assembled to see what would happen and as none of them would sign the agreement under which munda station was run they were ordered off the premises the police were drawn up outside the shed and under tom dow's instruction 
the unionists quietly walked back to their camp which was about a quarter of a mile below the wool shed on the public roadway the union camp was now in full working order and the number of men in it increased daily pickets in squads of four were formed armed with heavy waddies made from saplings these pickets were ordered to bring into camp any men found making their way to the wool shed only ten men had come over from the union camp to join in the shearing and these deserters as they were called would have had a warm reception if the unionists had captured them inside the shed all was bustle and excitement for an hour or two but the men quickly settled down to their work and it was surprising the rate at which some of them shore the sheep all classes of men were represented on the board they're a miscellaneous lot said ted laughing and judging from their movements i imagine sheep shearing is new work to them however they generally do their best and the sheep do not suffer much you see the fifth man on the right win yes said wyndham he does not seem very easy at his work he was a trainer in sydney said ted he's a good sort of fellow had bad luck and could get nothing to do in his line he applied to a friend of mine who said he was sure i would give him a chance and so packed him off up here if he can't manage the shearing i'll give him a chance with a horse or two here what on earth can a trainer know about shearing asked wyndham fraser that is the man's name told my friend he had shorn sheep before but it must have been a good many years ago long before machines were invented look at him now he's having a struggle with that sheep why he's cut himself i'll stop him and give him a chance elsewhere said ted sam fraser was nothing loath to leave his place on the board he had come in for plenty of chaff during the short time he had been doing his best to shear you'll never make a fortune at that game fraser said ted bryce i think horses are more in your line than sheep sam fraser gave a comical smile as he bound up his hand and said it's a good many years since i handled a sheep mr bryce there were no machines then i can handle a horse though with any man when i get a chance my luck's been dead out or i should not be here trying to shear i'll give you a chance with a horse or two i have said ted in the meantime you can either look on or go outside thank you mr bryce said fraser i'll do my very best for you some of the men shear well said ted for a scratch lot they do not trouble much about their clothes said wyndham most of the shearers had moleskin pants on and a flannel singlet with no overshirt and socks were discarded many of them being barefooted although here and there a man had a rough pair of shoes made out of a piece of bagging or wool pack with string for laces it will make an excellent picture said wyndham if i can manage to do it justice i must be very careful about the sheep this time he added laughing you have not forgotten that incident said ted bryce i consider the remarks i made on your picture were well timed for it was through my attempt at criticism we became known to each other i expect your sheep this time mr hanworth will be so lifelike we shall feel inclined to sit and look at them just to see if they move said ida i hardly think i shall carry the deception so far said the artist with a smile but i shall try my best to make the picture a success shearing was going on briskly when the men were knocked off at eight for breakfast and resumed work an hour later i think we may as well ride back said ted bryce i'm hungry i don't know how you all feel the keen demands of appetite are upon me said ida it was early when we left munda about five o'clock said ted i wonder what the sydney ladies would say to that i expect mrs bryce would be very shocked if she heard you were galloping around the country at such an unearthly hour in the morning shearing went on all right in the shed for two or three days and the unionists made no move although they were still camps on the same spot the shearers occupied a hut built of pine slabs with an iron roof the shed hands called rouseabouts had a building to themselves and also the wool scourers the men were lively in their huts at night and passed the time away merrily the unionists could hear them singing and dancing and were in an ill humour because the shearing appeared to be going on very well without them tom dow had great difficulty in keeping them in order and he felt they would break out before long ever since the night wide awake had fought and beaten him 
bully spence had been eager for revenge spence had his followers still and he was a dangerous man a regular firebrand in such a mixed community eli spence sneered at tom dow and characterized him as a weak-hearted man afraid to show what the unionists were made of a couple of nights after shearing had commenced eli spence was the centre of a group of a dozen men he was speaking to them earnestly and tom dow knew he was up to no good he moved towards the group and eli spence did not see him he heard spence say ah for strong measures if we can't get at the shed there's the homestead all the police are down here at the wool shed they'll never think of a raid being made on the homestead there's some rare fun to be had up there said eli with a savage grin there's a couple of nice-looking girls there and if we capture them i reckon mr edward bryce would quickly come to terms with us then you're a fool eli spence said tom dow i warn you again not to mention these things i will have no acts of incendiarism here while i'm in charge of the camp such acts of violence injure our cause if we must fight let us fight fair bravo tom shouted several men do the masters fight fair shouted eli spence some of their men do what about wide awake said a man there was a loud laugh at spence's expense and the hit went home i said the masters do not fight fair roared eli spence we can't get our rights by fair means let's get them by foul say i we're a hundred and fifty strong here now and we all sit down like a lot of blessed sheep and let these non-union fellows take our places we could get possession of that shed in half an hour if we were all of one mind tom dow saw eli spence's words had some effect on the men he tried to counteract them by urging the men not to commit any acts that would bring them within the clutches of the law when the lights were put out eli spence and a few of the more desperate men in the camp were plotting how they could best make an attack on the homestead with success we ought to fire the place said eli there'll be no lives lost you need have no fear of that they'll all be able to get out before there's any danger but once the place is fired it will burn to the ground nothing can save it that will show we mean business at any rate i'd sooner see the wool shed fired said one man that would do the most damage can't it be done eli could be done but there's a greater risk of being caught police are always on a lookout there while the homestead is unguarded i'm for burning the homestead as it can be done easily said eli spence these scoundrels talked for a couple of hours before they turned in and it was eventually decided if tom dow still remained inactive they should take the matter into their own hands these men were not regular shearers all of them with the exception of eli spence had joined the camp only a short time they were men who professed to be staunch unionists but were unmitigated loafers anxious to gain admission to the camp in order to idle away their time and be fed at the expense of the union it was these men who did the unionist cause so much harm tom dow knew what these men were but he had no means of getting rid of them if he ordered them out of the camp and they went to the woolshed and offered to be taken on he knew he would be blamed for it to order them out of the camp would be a dangerous experiment it was a difficult position for tom dow to be placed in he did not believe in open acts of violence but he saw no chance of averting them if he warned edward bryce his warning would probably be construed into a threat by sergeant tyler he determined to watch eli spence and his mates closely and by timely interference try and prevent them from damaging edward bryce's property and at the same time doing incalculable injury to the union cause tom dow was a thorough believer in the justice of his cause he was bound up in unionism his was a narrow mind and like many men of his class he was full of prejudices according to his lights he acted as he thought right but there is no more dangerous man than he who becomes a fanatic believing in the justice of his cause such a man is not open to conviction tom dow was such a man 
and he placed the cause he advocated before everything End of chapter twelve Chapter thirteen of Who Did It by Nat Gould This Librivox recording is in the public domain Herbert Golding MLA It is necessary for the continuance of the story that Munda Station should be left for a brief period, in order to ascertain how affairs had progressed in Sydney since the departure of Ida Bryce and Flora Hanworth. Herbert Golding acted the modest man after his election to the Assembly. Deputations waited upon him to congratulate him upon his success, and he modestly disclaimed any merits of his own contributing to it, and alluded to his late partner's popularity as being mainly responsible for his election. At a general meeting of the investors and depositors in the Amalgamated Land and Investment, etc., company, when Herbert Golding took the chair, he was received with loud cheers. The statement he made to the meeting still further enhanced his popularity. He gave a glowing account of the prosperity of the company, and said the directors declared a dividend of ten per cent, and carried over several thousands to the reserve fund. All depositors would receive ten per cent on deposits, and the chairman stated that the interest would be paid at the offices on a certain date. It was a large meeting, and there was not a dissentient voice raised against the policy of the directors. When people receive 10% for money on deposit, they seldom give a thought as to how such a large percentage can be paid. It was so in this case, and Herbert Golding's statement was continually interrupted by cheers. After the meeting, the majority of those present remained behind. Herbert Golding had an idea this gathering had something to do with himself, so he lingered about the offices to hear the news. The preliminaries had evidently been settled before. In a very short time, a messenger was dispatched to see if Mr. Golding had left the building. Fortunately, he had not done so. He had not the slightest intention of doing so until he knew what had taken place upstairs in the boardroom. When he entered the room, there was again much cheering. One of the directors said he had been deputed on behalf of the shareholders and depositors to ask Mr. Golding to accept a slight offering from them as an acknowledgement of the excellent services he had rendered the company as chairman of directors, and also at the same time to celebrate his election as member for Balmain East. The subscribers wished to know if Mr. Golding would consent to sit for his portrait to be painted by that rising young artist, Wyndham Hanworth, whose ability was beyond question, and who would be sure to do justice to his subject. When Herbert Golding heard who was to paint the portrait, a strange feeling of uneasiness crept over him. Why, he could not tell. He had no cause to dread Wyndham Hanworth painting him. He had only met the artist once or twice at the Bryce's. He knew Mr. Hanworth was a great friend of Edward Bryce, and he also knew the artist selected was the best man they could have chosen. Herbert Golding did not like the idea of Wyndham Hanworth painting his portrait, but he was not the man to raise objections in a case of this kind. He thanked those present in feeling terms for the honour done him, and expressed the pleasure it would give him to sit to Mr. Hanworth, who was an artist of recognised ability, and with whom he had a slight acquaintance. When Herbert Golding left the offices of Amalgamated Land and Investment Company, he took a hansom and drove to Mrs. Bryce's residence. He found her at home, and she welcomed him cordially. Herbert Golding was always well received by Mrs. Bryce. His constant visits since the death of her husband had caused people to talk, but as he was one of the executors of Mrs. Bryce's will, excuses were made for his presence at her house. He was not in love with Mrs. Bryce, although he had no doubt she would accept him, if he offered her his hand, as soon as decency permitted. He was too selfish to think of anyone but himself, and it was self-interest prompted him to encourage Mrs. Bryce, in the belief that he loved her. She had fifty thousand pounds, a fine residence, and was not a bad-looking woman into the bargain. The fifty thousand pounds Herbert Golding knew would be very useful to him at the present time. It certainly was a nuisance, he thought, 
that this sum of money should be mortgaged heavily in the person of mrs bryce but as he could not obtain the money without the lady he resigned himself to accept both why should a man situated as herbert golding be in want of money he was a partner in one of the oldest and best firms in sydney he was chairman of directors of a flourishing company and he was an m l a with three hundred a year for pocket money surely such a man could not be in want of money yet herbert golding required money and a large sum dr langside had not been satisfied in going through the books of bryce golding and company there was a sum of close upon thirty thousand pounds he could not satisfactorily account for herbert golding explained that the sum was advanced him by the late mr bryce for certain purposes connected with the amalgamated land and investment company in fact the thirty thousand was for the purpose of extending the operations of that company he acknowledged the late mr bryce was not a shareholder in the company but he said the advance was fully secured on property held by the company edward bryce had accepted this explanation without giving the matter much thought but on consideration he had empowered dr langside to act for him in the matter during his absence and go thoroughly into particulars with herbert golding dr langside requested herbert golding to furnish him with full particulars as to this advance of thirty thousand pounds this herbert golding had not yet done and the doctor was becoming impatient at last to allay his suspicions herbert golding had promised to refund the whole of the money within twelve months he said the company was flourishing and could in that time easily pay back such a sum the money has been taken out of the firm said dr langside and there is no proof that mr bryce empowered you to act in this manner i have no doubt your statement is correct you are one of the executors and i am acting for mr edward bryce and am also myself an executor and i am sure mr golding you will see it is to the interests of the firm this money should be put into the business again times are not so good now as they were formerly and even to a firm such as bryce and golding thirty thousand is a sum of vast importance i thoroughly agree with you dr langside said herbert golding my partner trusted me in everything in the matter of the advance to the company he knew i was chairman of directors and therefore in a position to know how it stood financially i candidly admit at the time mr bryce agreed to allow the money to be drawn out the company was not in such a good position as it stands to-day as to the mortgages they are all in proper order and you can see them if you wish as executor i should like to see them said dr langside they were not with mr bryce's papers no said herbert golding as it was purely a matter of transferring the money from one business to another business mr bryce kept his papers in the office i will show you them said herbert golding as he opened a safe and took some papers out handing them to dr langside dr langside examined them carefully they looked all right but he had his suspicions he disliked herbert golding but that did not influence him and he had no wish to be unfair to him in consequence he would have liked to take the papers to his solicitor but as herbert golding was one of the executors he did not feel inclined to adopt this course the papers will be perfectly safe here he said as he gave them back to herbert golding who locked them in the safe again after further conversation herbert golding had agreed to the money being repaid into the firm by the land company within twelve months and with this promise dr langside expressed himself satisfied herbert golding had secured an advance of thirty thousand pounds from the firm of bryce golding and company and he had placed the bulk of the money at the disposal of the amalgamated land investment company because at the time he did so he had every faith in the company and was sanguine he would clear a large sum by using this money how he obtained henry bryce's consent to the advance of this large sum or whether henry bryce knew it had been advanced was at present only known to herbert golding dr langside had his suspicions but he said nothing he was a medical man and could keep his own counsel in the course of an extensive medical practice 
Dr. Langside had some curious family secrets committed to him. They were as safe with him as though the recipient of them had died and had them buried with him. He was not a man to talk about other people's affairs. He could not, however, help knowing what had been told him, and, curiously enough, when attending a director of the very company Herbert Golding was chairman of, he had listened to a statement that did not redound to that gentleman's credit. This particular director had an idea at the time he was about to die, but he recovered. When he regained his health, he was in a fever of anxiety when he thought of all he had said to Dr. Langside. In a casual way, suppressing his anxiety as well as he was able, he alluded to what he had stated to Dr. Langside. The doctor looked at him steadily and replied, My dear sir, I never take notice of what my patients say when they are delirious, or not quite in their right senses. I hear what they say, but it is my invariable rule to forget it afterwards. Quite right, doctor, quite right, was the reply. You are a model of discretion. I wish there were more men like you. Let me give you a word of advice, said Dr. Langside with a smile. Do not make any more confessions before you are quite certain you are going to die. Herbert Golding was thinking over this £30,000 as he drove to see Mrs. Bryce. He determined, if he saw no other way clear, to marry her and invest the bulk of her money for her in the Amalgamated Lands Investment Company. In other words, pay by means of her money the 30000 back into the sound firm of Henry Bryce, Golding & Company. That would relieve him of one grave responsibility. But there was a far more important and all-disastrous one looming ahead. Herbert Golding was not a fool. He was a calculating, hypocritical rogue with the manners of a gentleman and a smooth-faced look that disarmed suspicion in most people. He, above all the directors, knew the exact position of the Amalgamated Land and Investment Company. The other directors were mere puppets, and Herbert Golding's advice was always followed. The responsibility rested upon Herbert Golding, but the other directors, in neglecting their duties and implicitly trusting their chairman, would be held equally responsible should anything go wrong. Herbert Golding's thoughts were not pleasant as he drove to Mrs. Bryce's residence. He knew perfectly well that the Amalgamated Land and Investment Company was not in a flourishing condition, and he was also aware that the last dividend had been paid out of money recently deposited. End of chapter 13「Chapter fourteen of Who Did It by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mrs. Bryce accepts. Of course, I am aware the wedding could not take place for some months, said Herbert Golding to Mrs. Bryce. But my dear Lydia, that need not stand in the way of our engagement. I want to feel that you are mine and mine only. If you prefer it, we can keep our engagement a secret until you think proper to disclose it. But give me a decided answer, Lydia. This suspense is intolerable, and I can bear it no longer. My love for you must plead in excuse for me, and if you love me as I love you, I'm sure you will consent. Thus spoke Herbert Golding to Mrs. Bryce, and he did not speak in vain. Mrs. Bryce meant to accept his offer all the time, but she wished to keep him in suspense for a few moments. She declared her love for him, and accepted him as her future husband, but she wished the engagement to be kept secret, and would not agree to the marriage taking place until twelve months had elapsed since Mr. Bryce's death. This suited Herbert Golding exactly. He was not in a hurry to enter the bonds of matrimony. He fancied he could handle Mrs. Bryce to his own complete satisfaction. They chatted pleasantly and in a confidential manner. Herbert Golding knew better than to carry his profession of affection for her too far, but he flattered Mrs. Bryce and fooled her easily. Money matters cropped up. Herbert Golding had skilfully introduced the meeting held at the land company's office into the conversation. He knew Mrs. Bryce would be pleased to hear of the presentation to be made him, and accordingly he made the most of it 
and also of the company over which he presided. "'It must be a very flourishing concern,' said Mrs. Bryce. Ten per cent for deposits is really a wonderful interest.' "'It is,' said Herbert Golding. "'I had better strike while the iron is heated in the fire of love, and before it cools down,' he thought." "'I am afraid you will not receive ten per cent for your money as it is at present invested,' he said. "'Oh, dear, no, Herbert,' she replied, lingering over his name fondly. "'I only wish I could obtain ten per cent. What a difference it would make in my income!' "'There is no reason why you should not avail yourself of the opportunity to place your money in the Amalgamated Land and Investment Company,' he replied. "'I am chairman of directors, as you are aware, Lydia, and therefore know how thoroughly safe the bank is.' I am also, as one of Mr. Bryce's executors, bound to do the best I can for you in investing your money, and to be selfish, Lydia, as your future husband, I should take very good care your money was not risked in any foolish speculation. It was a specious argument, and Mrs. Bryce felt the force of it. Even had she been suspicious, which she was not, the fact that Herbert Golding was engaged to her would have disarmed her suspicion her future husband would not be likely to rashly risk her money he gave her time to think over all he had said have you much money invested in the company she asked the bulk of my money is of course in the firm said herbert golding but i have about fifteen thousand in the company in shares none on fixed deposit but shares are more risky than deposits said mrs bryce depositors are paid in full before shareholders can claim a penny said herbert golding but i can assure you there is no possible risk or i should not lend my name as chairman of directors or have fifteen thousand pounds worth of shares to my name i should like to get ten per cent said mrs bryce you could invest some of my money in the company for me i should advise you to place it in the bank on deposit he said it is less trouble and of course safer and ladies always like to be on the safe side in such matters and quite right too said mrs bryce how much should you advise me to deposit do you ask me that question as your future husband or as chairman of directors he said as my future husband herbert the fact of you being chairman of directors only makes your advice the more valuable she replied i wonder how much he'll venture thought herbert golding i'll make a plunge for it as your future husband lydia he said and wishing to give you the benefit of my advice and experience i advise you to place the bulk of your money in the bank on fixed deposit for twelve months if at the end of that time i in my position as chairman of directors see any cause to recommend you to withdraw the whole or any part of the money i will advise you to do so she did not look startled at what he had said and herbert golding felt sanguine of success as you say she replied the deposit could be for twelve months and by that time you would be my husband i should prefer to keep some money invested elsewhere say ten or twenty thousand the remainder could be placed in your bank on fixed deposit lydia he said with well-feigned emotion you have indeed made me a happy man you have shown you not only love me but that you have unbounded confidence in me it is very good of you i shall never forget it he stooped over and kissed her tenderly mrs bryce was in a heaven of delight at that moment she would willingly have entrusted herbert golding with the whole of her fortune i should not love you as i do if i had not confidence in you she said if you are happy herbert so am i very happy indeed poor henry bryce it is to be hoped for his own sake he had not departed to a place from whence he could witness this scene and hear his newly made widow confess her love for another man before herbert golding left mrs bryce she had given him full authority to invest thirty thousand pounds in the amalgamated land and investment company his next step was to inform dr langside in case he should hear of it elsewhere of what had taken place of course mrs bryce can do as she pleases he said the money is absolutely her own as one of the executors however i shall inform her i do not think she is acting wisely and why pray said herbert golding have you any reasonable objection to advance against the company i have the honour to occupy a prominent position in no said dr langside except he hesitated well 
said Herbert Golding. "'Except the fact that ten per cent on fixed deposits is rather too good to last long,' said Dr. Langside. "'I need not have informed you of this matter at all,' said Herbert Golding. "'But as you were one of the executors, I thought it only a matter of courtesy I should do so. I have also written to Edward Bryce on the subject. As to the percentage, I grant it is exceptional interest, but the company is itself an exceptionally fortunate one, and our speculations have all turned out well. Mrs. Bryce will only deposit her money for twelve months. If at the end of that time she wishes to do so, she can withdraw the whole or any portion of it. Dr. Langside was not satisfied. He felt there was more behind this than he had been told. He thought the matter over, and came to the conclusion it would be better for Edward Bryce to allude to the subject to his stepmother. He received a letter from Edward Bryce, asking his opinion, which he gave candidly, and it coincided with Edward's view of the matter. Edward Bryce then wrote to Mrs. Bryce in a polite way, stating he had heard from Mr. Golding that she intended placing the bulk of her money in the Amalgamated Land and Investment Company. He advised her to consider well before she took this step. He urged her not to trust a large sum to any banking company of this description. He did not allude to Mr. Golding in any way, except to mention the fact that he had heard from him. The letter concluded with a message from Ida and Flora. Mrs. Bryce smiled when she read her stepson's letter. How young and inexperienced he is, she thought, but he does not know all. He does not know Herbert is my intended husband. There is no necessity to inform him of our engagement yet. When he does know of it, he will see matters in a very different light. I can trust Herbert implicitly. Even a bad man would not recklessly throw away his intended wife's money. And Herbert is such a good fellow, and bears such a high character. So it came about that Mrs. Bryce, through Herbert Golding, placed £30,000 at fixed deposit in the Amalgamated Land and Investment Bank. She duly received a proper acknowledgement of the same, and was perfectly satisfied with herself and Herbert Golding. Herbert Golding had managed this little transaction on his own account. He had given his brother directors very little information on the subject, but he had frightened them into agreeing that the deposit of £30,000 should go to pay back the money obtained from Bryce, Golding & Company. He had explained to them clearly that if this amount was not replaced to the firm, there would be an unpleasant exposure. When he mentioned Dr. Langside's name, the director the doctor had attended during his illness almost dropped out of his chair with fright. He at once strongly supported all Herbert Golding said. As a rule, he was the only director who occasionally put his foot down when the chairman became arbitrary, and Herbert Golding was pleased at the somewhat unexpected assistance received from this quarter. When asked how the large deposit was to be refunded to Mrs. Bryce at the end of twelve months, he smiled, and hinted they need have no fear on that score, as by that time he might stand in a much nearer relation to Mrs. Bryce. Of course, he mentioned this matter privately in order to allay their fears. Herbert Golding felt a different man since Mrs. Bryce had made him her confidant in all things. He took good care the money she had placed in the bank was secure, and in a short time he meant to transfer it over to Bryce, Golding & Company, or rather to Edward Bryce, as the money was lent by Henry Bryce personally. The money had been, so Herbert Golding said, taken out of the firm, but only on Henry Bryce's account. After these transactions, Herbert Golding was more assiduous than ever in attending to the wants of his vicar. He worked hard and spared no trouble to make a still further good impression on the parson, and he succeeded. The vicar was a most respectable advertisement for the Amalgamated Land and Investment Company, although he was unaware of it. The good, harmless man trumpeted forth the virtues of Herbert Golding, M.L.A., far and wide. He held him up as a paragon of perfection. He even went so far as to deposit a thousand pounds devoted to the church building fund, over which he had sole control, in the Amalgamated Land and Investment Bank. 
many persons in his congregation followed suit and the directors of the bank and company wondered at herbert golding's audacity when some spiteful individual hinted in the house that these land banks were not legitimate banks and did not transact their business in a legitimate banking way herbert golding replied to him and crushed him he pointed out how the honourable member in question was a director of a bank that only paid a miserable interest on deposits and that in consequence the bank the honourable member was connected with suffered in the competition he went so far as to advise the honourable member to invest some of the uninvested funds of the bank he was connected with in the amalgamated land and investment company then said herbert golding you may have a chance of placing your bank on an equality with the newer and more enterprising institution such as the one i am proud to be connected with this was too much for the honourable member who left the chamber and was discovered later on in the refreshment room drowning his exasperated feelings in malt liquor mrs bryce read herbert golding's speech he marked it in blue chalk and had it sent to her it increased her estimate of her future spouse considerably herbert golding was in fact becoming so exalted on all sides that he actually commenced to believe the good things said and written about him were true End of chapter fourteen